Welcome to Time Traveling Team, the weekly podcast where we review every story of Doctor Who right from the very beginning. I'm Paddy. And I'm Trisha. This week we join the Doctor and Adric as they try to fix the TARDIS communion circuit and end up coming face to new face with the Master in Legopolis. As usual, we will be discussing the Doctor, the companions and the villains and giving our thoughts on the story as a whole. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on this story, so in order to join in the discussion, you can check us out at Time Team, that's T-I-M-E-T-E-A-M-P, on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, or X as Twitter is now known as, or you can email us at timetravellingteam at teamproductions.com. Now though, Paddy, if you would please do us the honour of recapping the final story of this season. I'll see if I can, you know. <laughs> Am I emotionally prepared for this? I asked you that earlier, you didn't answer, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, this is why we pay you the big bucks. All right. <laughs> you got paid? <laughs> this uh, is our childhood all over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but anyway, right. take it away. Okay. Part one. In modern day Britain, a police constable uses a police call box to contact his local station. During the call, the police box distorts momentarily and the call is cut out. The constable goes to investigate the phone, but he is suddenly dragged inside the police box, from which an evil laugh sounds. Meanwhile, on the TARDIS, the doctor is pacing back and forth in a cloistered garden when Adric comes looking for him. The doctor tells him that when he is in this area, he is not to be disturbed, and unless it is an emergency, and even then, Adric can use the cloister bell to summon him. Adric asks what the cloister bell is, and the doctor says that it is an alarm that is only sounded during the greatest of catastrophes. The doctor then talks about the age and nature of the TARDIS, noticing how it has been deteriorating throughout his travels. Adric says that he can fix it on Gallifrey, but the doctor expresses reluctance to returning there, especially since he will have to explain Romana's absence, which is in direct contribution of Gallifrey's non-interference laws. He suggests letting a bit more time pass before returning there, and instead says he will take Adric to visit Earth. He says that he wants to visit Britain so they can see an actual police call box. He explains to a confused Adric that the police box is what the TARDIS has been based its appearance on. He wants to measure the external dimensions of one of them so that he can take it to a planet called Legopolis, where he hopes to deal with the issues plaguing the TARDIS chameleon circuit. Just as they are about to head back to the console room, the cloister bell starts to ring. They rush to the console room, but the ringing suddenly stops, leading the doctor to wonder if there is another symptom of the TARDIS's deterioration. Back on Earth, Tegan Javanka is taken by her aunt Vanessa to her first day in her new job as an air stewardess. After a bit of a scatterbrain start, they make their way to the airport, but en route they get a flat tyre and pull in near a police call box, where they see an abandoned policeman's bicycle. Aunt Vanessa suggests calling for help, but Tegan says that they can repair the flat themselves. Back on the TARDIS, the Doctor and Adric reach the console, and the Doctor explains how he came into possession of the time-space machine. He gives Adric a demonstration as to how the chameleon circuit should work, which prompts Adric to ask why the Doctor is suddenly interested in anonymity, especially seeing as how they dealt with the Master on Traken. The Doctor, however, says that he is an ill feeling since they left Traken, which has been hampered by the sounding of the cloister bell. They land on Earth, but the Doctor says that they missed their intended target. He turns on the external view screen and they see the, um, the mysterious police box, as well as Tegan and Aunt Vanessa repairing the flat tyre. Adric asks if they are going to outside to measure it, but the doctor says that he doesn't want to draw attention and he dematerializes again and rematerializes around the police box. Not wanting to waste time, the doctor starts measuring the police box, which is now in the console room. Back outside, Tegan discovers that the spare tire is also flat, leading her to admonish Aunt Vanessa. Unbeknownst to them, they are being observed by a mysterious white clothed figure. Aunt Vanessa grows frustrated as she tries to pump up the spare tire and again suggests going for help. However, the independent Tegan refuses again to seek aid, saying that as a near stewardess, she needs to be resourceful. In the TARDIS, the Doctor explains how the people of Legopolis achieved their scientific feats by speaking the equations and creating a physical outcome. Suddenly, a low whine comes from the console, and they take a look with the Doctor saying that it looks like a localised gravity bubble. He says that he will go outside and take a look, but mutters that he feels that he is overlooking something obvious. He tells Adric to stay behind whilst he goes outside to take a look around. He spots Tegan and Aunt Vanessa arguing over the car and prepares to head back inside to avoid them seeing him. However, he spots the figure in white and stares at it, knowing that despite the distance, the figure is staring back at him. He goes back inside and finds Adric trying to access the other police box. 
He suggested it may have something to do with the gravity bubble, and suddenly, the door to the police box opens. They go inside and see that they are inside another TARDIS console room, and then spot the authentic police box in the corner. Outside, Tegan admits defeat and says that she will go to a nearby garage to ask for help. As she goes, she spots the TARDIS and goes to it, thinking that she will be able to use it to call for help. However, the door opens and she goes inside, but just before she enters the console room, the other TARDIS vanishes. Tegan is amazed at her new surroundings, but grows alarmed when the TARDIS doors close. She calls out to see if anyone is there before going to take a look at the console. She flicks one of the switches, thinking it is an intercom, and calls for help, but the cloister bell starts to ring, and she goes down the corridor to investigate. A few moments later, Aunt Vanessa enters the console room looking for Tegan, but she retreats from someone who laughs evilly as they approach her. Meanwhile, on the other TARDIS, the Doctor and Adric find themselves in a loop after they open the actual police box, which only leads back into the console room of the TARDIS. They suddenly hear a cloister bell, distorted due to the gravity bubble. They press on as the Doctor says that someone else obviously landed a TARDIS around the police box, just as they had intended to do so, which caused the loop. They eventually reach the end of the loop, and the Doctor emerges outside, where he encounters a detective and two police constables investigating Tegan's now-abandoned car. The detective asks the doctor what he is doing there, but he says it is difficult to explain. The detective then leads him to the car and shows him inside. The doctor realizes that the master managed to escape from Traken as he looks on in horror at the miniaturized tissue compressed bodies of the police constable and Aunt Vanessa in the driver's seat. Part 2 Adric emerges from the TARDIS and watches as the doctor argues with the detective, who says he wants to take him in for questioning. The doctor says he needs to go after the master but the detective ignores him and starts to lead him away to a nearby squad car. Noticing Adric hanging back, the doctor signals for him to cause a diversion. Adric takes the abandoned bicycle near the TARDIS and then lies on the ground with it on top of him, pretending that he fell off it. He calls out for help, which distracts the constables and the detective long enough for the doctor to flee into the TARDIS. Adric gets up and blocks off their pursuit by launching the bicycle at them before rushing into the TARDIS as well, where the cloister bell is still ringing. They discover that the other TARDIS has disappeared, and the Doctor says that they had better get away before planning their next move, but he discovers that it can't take off due to a mysterious strain on the power. The Doctor says that he will need to jettison some weight and decides to abandon Romana's room, snapping at Adric who asks him if he is sure. Adric then asks if he is going to answer the cloister bell, but the Doctor brusquely tells him to go answer it. However, as he makes his way down the corridor, the bell suddenly stops. He goes back to the console room to find the Doctor in deep contemplation. He tells Adric that he received a message from Traken, informing them of Tremas's disappearance. He says that the Master must have had a second TARDIS and surmises that he took Tremas to use his body. Adric asks if all the Time Lords can do this, but the Doctor tells him that the Master must have used the residual connection to the Keeper's powers to merge with Tremas. He then realises that the Master is still somewhere on the TARDIS, having guessed that the Doctor would try to fix the Chameleon Circuit. Adric asks if they are going to Logopolis, and the Doctor says that he can't risk turning the Master loose on the planet and its people. Adric asks how they can flush him out of hiding, and the Doctor takes his question literally and says that they will partially rematerialize underwater and let the water flood the TARDIS. Meanwhile, Tegan arrives at the Cloister Garden, and she watches as the other TARDIS materializes. She starts to look around it, but gets thrown to the floor when the TARDIS lands... She starts to look around it, but gets thrown to the floor when the TARDIS lands in the middle of the River Thames. Suddenly, the door to the other TARDIS opens and she hears the mysterious laughter coming from inside it. Back in the control room, the Doctor and Adric brace themselves as they prepare to hold the doors against the water so that it will flood the rest of the TARDIS. However, they are surprised when nothing happens. They open the doors to see what is outside and they discover that they have landed on a barge in the middle of the river. The Doctor says that there is something not quite right about what's going on, and then takes a look at his surroundings. In the distance, he spots the figure in white observing them from a bridge. The figure then beckons to them. The Doctor tells Adric to wait whilst he goes to meet the figure. Adric watches as the Doctor and the figure speak to one another. The Doctor returns a short while later and tells Adric that they are going to Legopolis, telling him that he has had a vision of the future and they need to prepare for the worst. Adric asks if it was the Master that he spoke to, but the Doctor says that it wasn't, before telling the concerned boy that he won't be able to help him as something is happening that could fracture the laws of the universe. Back in the Cloister Garden, Tegan tries to find a way out, but keeps arriving back into it. As she continues to try and find a way out, she fails to notice the TARDIS dematerialise and then reappears as a tree. The TARDIS arrives in Logopolis and hovers over a cluster of buildings beneath a large antenna dish. The Doctor tells Adric that he would have to stay on Logopolis. 
Adric begins to argue with the doctor, but they're interrupted by the arrival of Tegan, who demands to speak to the person in charge. After a confusing series of introductions, the doctor asks Adric how she got on the TARDIS, but she interrupts them and demands to be taken back home so Aunt Vanessa can take her to the airport. A shocked doctor describes the body that he saw in the car, and after she confirms it, he tells Adric that Tegan needs to come with them. The TARDIS lands in a courtyard where a group of Logopolitans are gathered. The other TARDIS, who still disguises the tree, materialises behind them moments before the Doctor and the others come out of their one. One of the Logopolitans warmly welcomes the Doctor, and the Doctor thanks him, addressing him as Monitor. Monitor then leads them through the buildings, where the other Logopolitans are busy working on abacuses, and the Doctor asks about the antenna. Monitor says that they occasionally have to use technology to help with their computations. He leads them to the control room with the computers, which again surprises the Doctor. He presents the monitor with the dimension readings he took from the TARDIS before joining Adric in investigating the various pieces of equipment. Monitor then starts calling out the readings into a speaker, and the other Logopolitans start working on their abacuses. However, the other t- TARDIS materializes behind one of them, and the, this time disguises a stone column, and the Master uses his tissue decompressor to shrink and kill the Logopolitan. Back in the control room, Adric argues with Tegan over stowing away on the TARDIS when she asks about what is going on. Monitor hands the Doctor a readout which he says will help him repair the chameleon circuit. The Doctor thanks him for his help and prepares to leave, but he suddenly remembers why the control room looks so familiar. He says that it is the perfect replica of the Pharos Project, a deep space research facility on Earth that was created to try and contact alien life. Monitor says that they recreated it via mathematics, and the Doctor marvels at the fact that the Logopolitans could recreate any space-time event through the same process. As they return to the TARDIS, the Doctor quietly asks Monitor to look after Adric and Tegan whilst he goes about his task. He enters the TARDIS and closes the door, leading Monitor to tell a confused Adric that the Doctor is testing a new code in case he made any errors. Adric worries the Doctor is in danger, but Monitor assures him that he is perfectly safe before offering them a tour of the city. Tegan again expresses her annoyance at the delay in returning home, but Adric is suddenly surprised to hear Nyssa calling out for him. He finds her nearby and she tells him that a friend of the Doctor brought her to Logopolis. Adric introduces her to Tegan before going to investigate the TARDIS, which has started to glow blue and begun shrinking. Monitor expresses confusion as to what is going on, and they watch as it continues to shrink, unaware that they are being observed by the figure in white. Part 3. The TARDIS stops shrinking at about 3 feet tall. Adric asks what happened, but Monitor is confused as to how the error occurred, and orders a group of Logopolitans to take to the Central Register building. Inside the TARDIS, the Doctor, who had been thrown to the floor, struggles to the control console so he can dematerialize, but discovers that it doesn't work. Unbeknownst to Adric and the others, they pass the Master in his new body, who gloats at his coup against the Doctor. In the Central Register building, Adric offers to help Monitor go through the computation code to discover where the error occurred. As they go through the painstaking process, Adric asks why the Logopolitans don't use computers for this type of work. The increasingly anxious Monitor tells him that block transfer computation which is what the Logopolitans are famed for, is a mathematical process that changes the physical world and machines cannot be used to create the code lest they themselves change. He says that only the living brain is immune and they use the machinery they have to record and store created codes. He says that the source for the error must be somewhere else as they can't find it amongst the Logopolitans in the central register and they go out into the streets. Meanwhile, the Logopolitans use sonic wave projectors to shield the TARDIS and give the Doctor respite from the force holding him to the floor. Out in the streets, Monitor and Adric discover the tissue-compressed bodies of three Logopolitans and they realise that someone deliberately sabotaged the code, which Monitor says is one of the greatest crimes in the universe. They return to the central register and correct the code. As they make their way back, Adric spots the figure in white, but Monitor hurries him along. Tegan takes the new printout and holds it up in front of the TARDIS so the Doctor can read it via the external view screen. Adric goes back outside and is followed by Nyssa, who says that she has come to find the Master in an attempt to rescue her father. Together, the two of them make their way into the city. Back in the Central Register, Tegan confronts Monitor about the other Logopolitans, who she views as little more than slave labour. Monitor explains that the purpose of their existence sorry. Monitor explains the purpose of their existence, but he's interrupted by the TARDIS, which has started to return to its normal size. The doctor emerges from inside and thanks them both for their help. 
Tegan tells him that Adric and Nyssa have gone to look for the master, and the doctor says that they should know better, highlighting how dangerous he is. He sadly tells Tegan about her aunt's fate, and he vows to stop the master. Meanwhile, in the city, Nyssa is lured away from Adric when she hears her father calling her name, and she encounters the master, completely unaware of his theft of her father's body. He explains he's changed appearance by saying that he needed to blend in on Logopolis so that he could discover what he tells her is a terrible secret. He tells her to go back to the central register, but tell no one of his presence on Logopolis. Before she goes, he attaches a bracelet to her, telling it will keep them linked. She meets back up with Adric, but suddenly complains about the tightness of her bracelet. Adric tries to help her get it off, but he receives an electric shock from it. Suddenly Nessa starts to reach for his neck, but she is stopped by the arrival of the doctor, who tells them to follow him. He reprimands them from going after the master alone, but they then spot the figure in white, and Nessa says that he was the one who brought her from Triton. Adric asks why the doctor earlier said he would need to prepare for the worst, and the doctor says it is because of the presence of the figure in white. Back in the central register, the masters managed to sneak in and kill the Logopolitans, returning the sonic projectors to their storage area. He then uses one of the projectors to send a signal disrupting the Logopolitans from their work. He then confronts Monter and Tegan and tells them to follow his instructions. The Doctor leads Adric and Nyssa back to the central register, and Nyssa points out how quiet it is. The Doctor then realises that Lycopolis was the Master's target all along. Back in the central register, Monter pleads with the Master to turn off the sonic projector, as he says that by disrupting the Lycopolitans from their work, he is unwittingly causing a wave of entropy throughout the universe. The Master says that he will turn it off after Monter reveals the true reason why they built a replica of the Pharos project. Monter says that he cannot reveal the secret. The Doctor and the others arrive, and he stops Nyssa from going to the Master, revealing her father's fate. He then reiterates Monter's point about the effect caused by the disruption of Legopolis. The Master says that they are over-exaggerating, but Monter says that Legopolis is a keystone of the universe, and that destroying it would have severe repercussions on causality. Adric uses the distraction to try and sabotage the sonic projector, but the Master uses the bracelet to control Nyssa and force her to stop him. Tegan charges the master, but he easily brushes her aside and he tells her to move the sonic projector or he will have Nyssa kill Adric. She reluctantly does so, but the doctor says that he needs to stop the disruption as it may already be too late. The master turns off the projector to prove that their worries are false, but the city is still silent, and Monster says that he has caused the destruction of Logopolis. They follow the master as he rushes through the city streets, which are filled with the dust remains of the Logopolitans. The Master says that they have done this to prevent his victory, and he attempts to force Nyssa to kill Monitor, but his control rod fails, with the Doctor telling him that the Entropy Wave has begun to affect his equipment. Monitor says that the Entropy Wave will rapidly grow now that Legopolis is doomed, but Nyssa says that surely the Entropy was bound to happen anyway. Monitor then reveals the secret of the Logopolitans, that they had been preventing universal entropy by using the replica of the Faris Project to create voids into other universes. The Doctor realises that one of these voids was how he entered E-Space with Romana. Monitor sadly says that without Legopolis, the voids will seal and the universe will die. The Doctor says that the only way to save the universe will be to team up with the Master. The others protest, but the Doctor tells them that they have no other choice. Suddenly the TARDIS appears, and the Doctor tells Adric, Nyssa and Tegan to get inside, saying that the pilot will look after them. Once they are inside, the Doctor reluctantly shakes hands with the Master, saying that they are the last hope of the universe. Part 4. The Doctor notices that Monitor has disappeared, and the Master suggests that he may have gone back to the Central Register to do what he can to delay the entropy. The Doctor agrees, and the two Time Lords make their way to the Central Register. After they go, Tegan emerges from the TARDIS and tells Adric, who tries to stop her, that the Doctor is the only way that she can get home again. Adric goes back into the TARDIS and it takes off, leaving Tegan to follow after the Doctor. The Doctor and the Master find Monitor working on a computer, where he tells him that he is trying to complete a code sequence that the Logopolitans have been working on in order to perpetually keep the voids open. He tells him to read the project notes whilst he tries to complete his task. He says that there is a void close by that they can try to reopen. Meanwhile, sorry, Tegan arrives much to the Doctor's surprise, but the Master tells him that they need to find a temporary refuge where they can attempt to solve the entropy problem. He begins to outline his plan, but suddenly Tegan points to Monitor, who fades from existence. The Master, fearing a similar fate, flees, and Tegan says they need to stop him, but the Doctor instead says that they should try and implement the plan the Master earlier mentioned, and asks Tegan to help him. The Doctor discovers that the plans for the project are still intact, 
and says that if he had a suitable computer to run them from, they could reopen the voids. Tegan asks where they can find one, and the doctor says on Earth, much to her delight. He then leads her into the city so they can find the master in his TARDIS. Meanwhile, on his own TARDIS, Adric and Nyssa watch the figure in white as he works on the controls. Adric notices that the figure is disconnecting the coordinate subsystems, and he tells Nyssa that they are being taken out of time and space. Back in Legopolis, the Doctor and Tegan find the Master buried under a pile of rubble, but still alive. They help him get free, and the Doctor demands that he take them to Earth. The Master lands his TARDIS at the actual Faris Project research facility. The Doctor approaches one of the technicians, who is oblivious to his presence as he is wearing headphones. The Doctor then spots the Master aiming his tissue compressor at the technician, and he shoves him out of the way, but accidentally renders him unconscious when he falls to the floor. The Master says that they have been spared a difficult conversation, and they can get to work on the plan. He expresses his doubts that they I'm sorry. He expresses his doubts that it will work, but the doctor says that all they can do is trust to hope. Meanwhile, on his own TARDIS, Adric and Nyssa walk around the cloister garden, with Adric commenting on how the doctor wanted to stop the deterioration of the time machine. Suddenly they see the figure in white beckoning to them, and Nyssa says that it seems that it wants to talk to S Adric specifically. After a brief conversation, Adric tells Nissa that the figure seems to know what the future holds and he leads her back to the console room, saying they need to get to the Faris project. Nissa then brings his attention to the external view screen and they see the whole universe slowly disappearing due to the rapid onset of entropy. Adric says that they will have to hurry. <laughs> Adric says that they will have to hurry, but Nissa sadly points out that Traken and its outlying systems have disappeared. Adric goes back to the control console and lands the TARDIS at the base of the antenna array. They exit the TARDIS but take cover from a security patrol. Inside the control room, the doctor says the program is up and running, but they need to realign the antenna dish from its own control room in order to aim it at the void so the signal can reach it. The doctor suggests using the master's TARDIS to get there, but the master says that he cannot use it as he disconnected a component called a light speed overdrive, which he said was essential to the plan. The Doctor says that he will need to go the long way around, and they head off. As they pass a window, the Doctor sees the TARDIS outside, with the figure in white standing by the door. The two groups carefully make their way through the grounds of the research facility, trying to avoid the guard patrols. The Master tries to dispatch one guard, but the Doctor stops him. However, the scuffle is overhead by a group of guards, and they are forced to flee across the grounds. They stop by an equipment shed and listen as the guards approach. Adric and Nyssa arrive, distracting the guards, and Tegan goes out to join them in order to give the Time Lords a chance to escape. However, the Master splits off from the Doctor and returns to the primary control room so he can reach the TARDIS. He arrives at the antenna dish control room ahead of the Doctor. He aligns the dish just as the Doctor arrives and tells him that all that needs to be done is to connect the power cable from the main control room to the computer console in the dish control room. As the Doctor does this, the Master goes out onto the walkway right beneath the dish and records a message for the people of the universe. He then goes back inside and the Doctor informs him that the void has been stabilised and will now remain open to prevent the entropy wave from destroying the universe. The Master congratulates him and then suggests that he go and help his companions deal with the guards. The Doctor agrees, saying that one mistake could reverse the whole process and the Master acknowledges this by saying that this was part of his plan. He plays the message for the Doctor which states that unless all the people of the universe submit to his power, he will reverse the process and destroy the void. The Doctor calls him mad and says that if he disconnects the exterior cable running through the dish, then the Master's plan will fail. He rushes out onto the walkway pursued by the Master, where they struggle. The Doctor manages to disarm the Master, who flees back inside and changes the alignment of the dish, which in turn starts to tilt the walkway. The Doctor shimmies his way across the tilting walkway and manages to disconnect the cable, but falls from the walkway, clinging to the loose cable. The Master hears guards approaching and laughs as he flees in his TARDIS. As he hangs on perilously, the Doctor's mind flashes back over the villains he has faced in his current incarnation, from the Daleks to the Black Guardian. He manages to swing on to one of the support struts for the dish, but he is unable to maintain his grip and he plummets to the ground, with his descent watched by Adric, Tegan and Nyssa. They rush to his body and call out to him, which leads him to remember all of his companions and his friends that he has known in his current incarnation, from Sarah Jane to Romana and K9. He then tells the trio that his end has come, but it has been prepared for. He weakly points to the figure in white, who approaches and merges with the Doctor. Nissa says that the figure was the Doctor from the future, and they watch as he regenerates into a younger, sandy-haired man who sits up and smiles at them. End of the story.
Well, this is it. The final trivia note for the fourth Doctor. So, Indeed. what do you got for us? Okay, so the air date for Legopolis is the 20th of February to the 21st of March, 1981. The writer of the story is actually Christopher Binmead himself. This is a mm. credited story for him, not just script editing or whatever. Um, it's the first of three writing credits for Christopher, again, outside of his Chris, his mm-hmm. blah, his script editing work, which we've discussed before. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see his own work again in Castrovala and Frontios. Mm. The director of the story is Peter Grimwade. This is the second of four directing credits for Peter. We previously saw his work in Full Circle and we'll see it again in Kinda and Earthshock. Christopher's inspiration for the recursive loop of the TARDIS, so a TARDIS within a TARDIS within a TARDIS mm. within ad nauseum. Mm. Um, he actually took that from the end of the Keeper of Tracking because the Master escapes via TARDIS within the Melkor, which is a TARDIS. So he ah. sort of took the sort of inception idea from there. Cool. Um, some have argued that this serial, at least certainly in the classic era, has like the largest body count <laughs> yeah. of any Doctor Who story, um, albeit not graphically shown, because we have the destruction of Legopolis, which causes a significant portion of the entire universe to be swallowed mm. by a wave of entropy. At the very least, the track in Union is destroyed. So not just track in itself, but Nissa mentions other planets as well. Um, which it was a death toll in the billions mm. and make the master a mass killer on an unprecedented scale. Albeit not intent that wasn't his intent. He didn't intend to do that. But that's what ended up happening. Now we do have stories later on that sort of rival that. Um, mm-hmm. you know, obviously the whole thing with the, you know, uh the, the revival time era, the mm. time war, um Flux. Whole thing with Flux. Like so there's a big thing, but like this is like Certainly for classic who this is the the biggest. Like mm. I think mm. the the closest that I would put to this is probably like Genesis of the Daleks, because we don't know how many people lived within those domes. Yeah. Or the other one would be the pirate planet. Yeah. But we don't know if those planets were inhabited or not. Mm. So whatever. Um the policeman using the police call box in the opening scene um, is named PC Donald Seagrave, but that only exists in the novelization, which Christopher Bidmead actually wrote himself. So he decided to give him a name. Um, the Watcher is an interesting character, and we may discuss him briefly later in terms of mm. overall thoughts, etc. Um, but what triggered his creation, which isn't actually fully explained on screen at all, no, like it's not. there's no explanation given whatsoever. Um, but basically, Christopher suggested that as multiple incarnations of the Doctor existed, it would be possible that a future transitional version could travel back in time to watch and guide events unfold. Now, that kind of contradicts with some other things, you know, in you know, future stories and time or whatever, but like, mm. this is really the first time we see this type of situation. It's not the last time we see it, the sort of foretelling of regeneration. We see it in other stories as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's where Christopher got this one. Logopolis itself comes from two ancient Greek words and there's sort of conflicting um, descriptions of it online. Some people say it's city of speech, city of words, or city of mathematics. Mm. Um, Basically, the whole idea was that it alludes to the oral calculations being recited by the Logopolitans. Nailed it. Um, the Pharos Project was named after the Egyptian island um, mm-hmm. upon which with stood the lighthouse of Alexandria. Interestingly, in the Sarah Jane Adventures, there is the Pharos Institute. Yeah. Which is like the scientific research establishment that Sarah Jane works with on occasion that mm. I'm guessing took their name from this story. I, th- I think so, yeah. This is the first regeneration story in which we see the Doctor shown to be fully conscious immediately after regenerating. Obviously, in the others, like, he was either passed out or Mm -hmm. asleep or, like, pseudo-dead or whatever. Yeah. So here we see him fully conscious after he regenerated. Mm -hmm. Um, In this story, we see the Doctor reveal a small panel among the TARDIS controls um, with a keyboard where the Doctor can actually put in what he wants the TARDIS to look like. Which is a very interesting idea because it means that not only is there the automatic version, yeah. 
yeah. uh, of the chameleon circus, you like you know that we've seen maybe the meddling monkeys and you know we've seen the masters as well, but also that you can do it manually, so you don't have to have it be blend in. You can have it be, hey, I've landed here, I want to look like a car, or whatever. Do you know, it, it, you don't have to let it do it itself, which is the first time we've sort of seen an indication of that. Um, you know, we'll go on in, in a little bit about how this is obviously Tom's last story as the fourth doctor. This is also the last story with any contribution by Barry Letts. Oh. This is his last story as ex- executive producer, and it's also the last story he contributed to as a whole. Oh, yeah, because like, didn't he only stick around for John in Turner's first season as a sort of a guiding hand? Yeah. I didn't realize it was the first, the, the, it was last contribution at all. Yeah. Um. Well, he's of on screen stuff. He may have done supporting stuff off screen. Um. The reason why the master doesn't get an appearance until like episode three is in order to make the watcher more mysterious. Do you know? Mm. Um. There are several indications, specifically by Adric, that the watcher is the master. Mm. Um, particularly the way he's sort of creepily just standing on the side of the motorway. Fucking random. Um, but that's why they didn't want to have the watcher and then immediately establish that the master was somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, they wanted to keep that going. Christopher Bigmead was a keen computer enthusiast and used many ideas from computer science in developing his scripts with, as, with elements such as the monitor, block transfers, and registers, all being derived from technologies used in computer architecture. He really wanted to get real science into Doctor Who. We've talked about this in previous episodes. Um, so he also drew upon, you know, thermodynamics. He made use of the concept of entropy. Um, and he basically was trying to put all of this into the story to make it feel more sciencey. He got a lot of ideas in language of the story from taking part to look at the inner workings of his vector graphics MZ system, which is his computer system whatever um i don't know we, we might end up talking about it i have a little bit of a of a of a thought in it in my overall about the use of you know real science as such in the story we'll get to it later um why were they on the barnet bypass <laughs> why were they just on a bypass <laughs> in the middle of nowhere there's a reason so john nathan turner noticed that there was a real police call box on the barnet bypass in london and Christopher Bidmead was fascinated with the TARDIS and the concepts of it. And he wanted to explore that more. So they're like, this is great. You know, we could, you know, combine the two things. The Barnet Bypass was one of the last left in the country by this point in time. Unfortunately, by the time they got around to going there and using it, the police box had been vandalized. And so they ended up having to use the TARDIS prop anyway. Mm. Which is a bit kind of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? Um, Tom Baker, you know, this is his final story. Again, we'll talk more in a second. Three days after his wedding to Lala Ward, he filmed the story. Not going to lie, I have been down the aisle myself, as have you, um, mm-hmm. with varying results. Yours has been better than mine. <laughs> but if she had tried to fuck off after three days to go to work, we may have had problems. The fact that their wedding, yeah. their marriage only lasted sixteen months. <laughs> oh Jesus! Christ. One would argue maybe not surprised. Um, the tempestuous doesn't even fucking begin to cover that relationship. Yeah, um, but this is Tom's last story, right? So here we see uh, the fourth Doctor's death scene or regeneration scene. The interesting is like so. You had a comment that you might get to in a second around the fall, the drop from the cable Mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, I don't think I have the comment you have because when I was that, like, the doctor was actually meant to scream as he fell to his death, and Tom completely disagreed. He felt it was unheroic for the doctor to scream, Mm. and he was very unhappy with the fact the final image that viewers would see of his doctor would be him lying prone, being photographed from above. And part of me is kind of like, that's how we met you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, like, how else? Like, very much at this time, like, obviously, like, nowadays, we get a lot of regeneration standing up. Um, yeah. But <laughs> much explode. less common. <laughs> explosions. <laughs> always fucking explosions. Yeah. Um, um, 
so yeah he wasn't particularly happy with it um during one take of the regeneration tom baker turned to matthew waterhouse and apparently said adric you're a the one word that we don't say so you're a <laughs> oh. you're a bunt <laughs> yeah. and you always will be <laughs> uh no the trivial point i have is and i saw it on this like 50 tv finales or moments mm. of all time whatever and it was tom's fall no uh actually in relation to like the whole thing with the scream because of the presence of the watcher uh what we know the watcher to be it's i think it's actually cool that he didn't scream because it just shows the doctor is accepting his fate yeah uh but no um if you so there's a scene of where like tom lets go mm. and then it's the camera cuts to Tegan, Nissa, and Adric all watching the descent. Yeah, if you none slow, of their eye lines match. Yeah, if you slow it down, they all look at the ground at different times. Yeah, oh, okay. so it's 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 like he bounced. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that none of their timelines. Yeah, their eye also, lines match pretty entirely. Also, they do a long shot of like supposedly the Doctor hanging off the rope, and it's just a little fucking army man hanging off a stick. That's that's what the prop is. <laughs> well, very mind, at one point when they're going through the recreation of the Pharos mm. um, Institute thing, um, they go from one room of uh, Legopo- Le- Le- oh, fuck it. How do we? How do we? Uh, Leg- Legopo- Legopolis. No, the people. Legopolis. Legopolis. Legopolitans. There we go. Went from one room of Lagopolitans into another room, and like it immediately goes from being a room of people to a painting of people. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, <laughs> when the walkway starts to turn, it cuts back to the master, and it's just a freeze frame of Anthony Ainley in the fucking doorway. Yeah. Also, Christ. Like, okay, we might get this later. Yeah, the walkway is turning because obviously the dish is turning, which is yeah. turning the walkway. The walkway has like. A railing. Mm. Stand up. But it, the, the railing only comes up to your ankles, like, to be fair. But stand on the railing mm. with your feet. So that becomes the floor. Mm. Um, you know, what I will say, right, is I, I know that we've like just kind of ragged on like, the effects for the last kind of two sequences. Mm. Complete side note. Nothing will ever be as fucking bad. Ever be as bad as a movie called The Game of Death. It was the last movie Bruce Lee was working on before he died. And they recreated it using filmed footage and new shit. And they had a a, a guy that was like uh, kind of passable, but not really. But they had a shot of him sitting down in front of a mirror. They fucking sellotaped a cutout of Bruce Lee's head onto the mirror for your man's reflection. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, nothing in Doctor Who will ever be as bad as that. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about more in a second around why Tom left. Um, but he apparently he was asked once at Longleat Celebration like why he left the series, and he replied that he was pushed by Anthony Ainley. <laughs> <laughs> um, according to DVD commentary, like Tom was dreading leaving the series, and he was also pretty angry all the time on the shoot. Um, he couldn't take comments or direction from anyone. Um, you know, Janet Fielding said that he was very angry with everybody. Um, and Jonathan Turner claimed that when Tom had finished his last scene, he just slipped away. He just got up and left. Which actually is very, like, that last part is very reminiscent of when John left. Mm. Because they went straight from filming um, Planets and Spiders into Robot. Um, so John kind of didn't get much of a hoorah either um it it is a bit of a thing throughout the course of who that basically the regeneration is well i think it's like with the exception of these guys it's essentially best of luck handshake tip out the fucking door while the other person films films their first scenes um yeah it's a very weird thing when you literally have the person replacing you in your clothes Mm. lying down I think probably, and we'll, we'll get to it in a few years, but I think the one that probably, for me, hits the weirdest is actually David Tennant. 
because he filmed his Sarah Jane Adventures episode after he after. had filmed his regeneration. Yeah, and like that was the every like, his his he, tenth Doctor regeneration. FYI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like that was because I think he did like I don't think like for himself and Matt Smith the regeneration wasn't the last thing they shot. So yeah, imagine, it's like, rarely ever the last. Well, I think was well, it's different in Classic Who because obviously they were doing um, live record, um, yeah. but in New Who, obviously they they film things out of order and, and whatever. Mm. Um, like he went on and there's a whole other story in a whole mm. other series. Yeah, as the Doctor or whatever. Um, speaking of Sarah Jane. Mm-hmm. So this story is the first to feature a human companion since Leela left because Adric isn't actually human because he's from in space. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also is like a weird evolution of a spider. Yeah. Whatever. Um, and it's also the first one to feature a contemporary Earth companion since Sarah Jane's departure in Hand of Fear. What's interesting about those two characters, so Leela and Sarah Jane, is... Elizabeth Slade and Louise Jameson were both asked to come back for this story oh. Oh. Um, to give a familiar face for the fourth doctor to go through his regeneration story with and to help ensure a smooth transition. Um, they both declined that request, which is why we have Nyssa and Tegan okay. in there instead, which I can kind of get again. We're ending a season with the regeneration Adric has kind of been around for a while, but possibly the episodes hadn't aired yet. Mm. So they may not have known how well Adric would stick with audiences Mm -hmm. as that connecting character from one doctor to another. Because I think, I think like with, like with Ben and Polly, I think it worked very well. I think with Sarah Jane, it worked very well to have that connecting companion. Mm -hmm. So the audience sort of feels comfortable. Um, and also, I think it would have been nice for for Tom, um, since him and Michael didn't get along at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, Matthew. But yeah, Matthew, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> didn't get along at this point. So, yeah. Um, we could have seen Sarah Jane again, but Elizabeth Sladen said no. <laughs> Boo. Um, on to the cast that we do have, though. So, mm-hmm. again, we have Nyssa, played by Sarah Sutton. So, this is her first, like, official companion episode um though obviously we did discuss her last week in the keeper of tracking and i said i'd leave a couple of her you know early work conversations this week so um sarah was born in 1961 she began acting at the age of nine in a.a Milne's willie the pooh uh, she made her first appearance as rue from willie the pooh um just five days after her ninth birthday at the phoenix theater in the west end in london that's adorable oh. as fuck um she also studied ballet as a child and she was 11 when she became the youngest British actress to play Alice on screen in a 1973 television film of Alice Through the Looking Glass. Oh. Besides her performance as Alice, she also appeared in a number of television programs before Doctor Who, including The Moon Stallion and The Crucible. As we discussed last week, the role of Nyssa was only ever meant to be for one story. Um, but Christopher brought her back and now she's gone on to stay as a companion. I discussed last week about some of the roles she's done and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, also, um, in this story, we pick up another companion, which is Tegan, played by Janet Fielding. This is the first of 21 appearances for Janet. Um, we'll go through more of her next week, just for, to keep this a bridge, because we've discussed a bit more about Tom. Um, but some of Janet's non-who credits include Hammer House of Horror, Shelley, The Adventure Game, Minder, Murphy's Mob and Prisoner Zero. The Master, again, we see Anthony Ainley. We discussed Anthony last week, where he also played Tremus in The Keeper of Tracking. The Monitor is played by John Fraser. He's the only Doctor Who credit for John. His non Who credits include Kidnapped, The Desert Rats, The Trials of Oscar Wilde, Operation Crossbow, Young Sherlock, and The Practice. John passed away back in 2020. The Watcher throughout the story, <laughs> the white guy with the thing, um, mm. uh, that's Adrian Gibbs. He's uncredited for his role as the Watcher in this, um, though he did have a credited role in Full Circle, where he played one of the guards. And Vanessa is played by Delore, or Do- I don't know how they pronounce her name, because it's D O L O R E. But I'd call Del- her I'd her Del- her IMDb is D E L O R E. 
Um, so Dolores Whitman, this is her only Doctor Who credit. Her non-Who credits include Rush, Mrs. Finnegan, Caddy and Bacon Possession. Dolores passed away in 2013. Coming in as the new Doctor, we have Peter Davison. We'll talk more about him next week or next time. But for now, hi, Peter. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hello. Um, but we're going to be saying goodbye to Tom. And we're going to be saying goodbye to Tom for a long ass while. So... Why did he leave? Um, well, there's a number of reasons. A big one was John Nathan Turner. Um, Tom and he did not see eye to eye. We've spoken about this before. Um, and the more that John revamped the character and the show, Tom just found more and more issues to critique. Um, the fact that like Doctor Who, like the episodes are only like 25 minutes. Um doesn't really accommodate the increase in regular cast members and all the extra things that John was trying to do, um, which from Todd's perspective led to problems driving the plot forward and put a heavy emphasis on the Doctor as the plot device rather than just as the stories unveiling themselves. Um, Tom also took issue with changes in the Doctor's costume. He felt it made the character look cheap. I agree. Mm. Bring back his original outfit. It was way better. Basically, all of these issues made Tom decide to leave in 1981. Um, Also, not helping, and we've discussed this as well, he had some serious health issues coming back from the the season break, um, which, with the demands of the role, it just, it was just time to, time to pack it in. Though he passed up on the opportunity to return to Doctor Who in The Five Doctors, which we'll discuss more about that when we, when we get to that point in time, he did come back for the Children Need Special Dimensions in Time, and also he returned for the 50th anniversary episode, The Day of the Doctor. Tom has also done a large, large, extortionate number of Doctor Who audio stories, both for BBC and Big Finish. Like, if you go on to his um, TARDIS wiki page and you scroll down to, like, the audio section... He's done audio stories for BBC with Liz Layden. He's done like, you know, the audio stories that came before Big Finish. He's done loads of audio stories with Big Finish. He's read novelizations. Mm. He's done a lot. Yeah. He also wrote his own Doctor Who novel, which you and I have mentioned before, mm-hmm. Scratchman, which was released in 2019. Other than Doctor Who, though, Tom did go on to have a career afterwards. He appeared in Black Adder, the Which Chronicles of Narnia, the, Sil- <laughs> the Chronicles of Narnia, the Silver Chair. He played Sherlock Holmes in the 1982 adaptation of The Hound of the Baskerville. He was in The Zany Adventures of Robin Hood, which is actually an American production, I believe. He was in Medics, Randall Hopkirk deceased. He narrated both the radio and television versions of Little Britain. He was in Mark of the Glen, and he was also in quite apt given what is currently airing uh star wars rebels where he played the bendu bendu is that how you pronounce it ben, yeah just bendu bendu uh yeah. also if i'm if i'm right there was a tv game show um a uk tv game show called fort boyard it was like set mm-hmm. on this like the Polyonic prison island and he played this like old sea captain that w- was just like he, he was like a part of the fort Essentially, you'd go in, he'd ask you a question, and then you'd go off to the next challenge. He also voiced the quiz master in the most annoying DVD PlayStation game ever invented, because Paddy always beats me at it, and it's a quiz game, and it sucks, and the only way I can beat him is like a wormhole appears out of nowhere. Oh, that, that stupid long hole fucking... I, I think we said that for like a rambling, we will try and do like an actual live <laughs> playthrough I, of that. I, I don't know how we would. I'm trying to remember how the game worked. And I don't think, I think it's whoever answers the question first. Wasn't it? No. Uh, or was it whoever you, got the question? No, or did no, we both no, get, or did no, we get a question you, each? You take turns. You can, cause you, oh, can, okay. you, you can play one player or two player. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Paddy beats me all the time because he's got a weird memory. And you um, beat me like because of that st- the stupid logic of how the wormhole system works. <laughs> Get the question wrong, you go fucking forward. Get the question right, you go backwards. Yay! <laughs> ah, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Cool. So time for one more delve into character discussion for Tom Baker's run on the show. So hmm. as per usual, we have the Doctor as played by Tom. For companions, we have... Are we, we just going to put in Adric, Nissa, and Tegan? Yeah. It's just easy. Um, when I was originally putting together my notes, I hadn't seen it yet. So I put Tegan in prominent character, but she's really the first character we meet, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she can go in. Um, prominent characters, we have the Monitor. And then for villains, we have the Master. We won't actually be discussing the new Doctor, because he literally says, like, one line. Um, he, does, he doesn't Anf- say anything. He just sits up. <laughs> oh, yeah, he does just sit up. Um, we won't be discussing Aunt Vanessa either. And we won't be discussing the Watcher as a character, but he may come up in during discussion. Mm-hmm. So, Paddy, as you did the old social readout, it means that mm-hmm. you get to go first. Thoughts on the Doctor in Tom's final story as the fourth Doctor. Please go. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> So, this is the second time the Doctor has known he's going to die. Mm. Um, but this, but like he and he finds out much earlier. Now, I think the like the the first I'm talking about the first Doctor now because the first Doctor knows that his body is failing him, and he mm. so like yeah. Um, but like other than but completely different than the last time, he knows much earlier that he is going to die. And I like that he doesn't rage against the dying of the light. He accepts it mm-hmm. because it's a very subdued performance from Tom throughout, but not in a bad way because mm-hmm. it's a, his, his representation of a person that's accepting their fate is great. Like mm-hmm. he snaps early on. I suppose it's the whole five stages of grief thing. It's mm-hmm. the denial aspect of it, but you then get the acceptance of at the end of episode three when he shakes hand with the master kind of going the die is cast mm. i i have to this will this will like i'll do what i can to save it and i know that i'll pay the price for it but i think tom's performance throughout is is great i think mm. his chemistry with like we talked last week about you know his attitude towards matthew mm. it's it's not great like you can't defend it like, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, Matthew was, he had a bit of a fucking cock of the walk thing about him because of the stature of the role that he had at the time. But again, we talked about the fact that he's a fucking kid on his first big, big break. Mm-hmm. You know, he's bound to do something stupid. Um, But he, we talked about once the cam once the director calls action, the doctor's chemistry with Adric is great. Mm-hmm. It's a protege role that he has now. Mm-hmm. Um. Then you know, Tis, you know sorry, Tissa, Nissa comes back into the mix, and he doesn't get a whole lot of time with Nissa, which is which is sad, you know. Hmm. Uh, but he has plenty of time with Tegan, and I like the dynamic that he had with Tegan, in hmm. the sort of like you know like this another fucking stowaway, but yet when she's the only one, like when she sticks around to say you know at the very end, you know I want you to get me home. He accepts her help. Like, he doesn't ridicule her or you're not smart enough or anything like that. It's, you know, she's a helping hand. Thanks very Mm. much. Um, I love these interactions with Monitor because you get this, you get the impression that, like, (laughs) is, I, I, like, I never heard anyone call him the Monitor. I just heard Monitor. Maybe they said it's off the. What? I assume it's the same way, like, everyone calls him Doctor. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the I like these. Inter- I love these interactions with the monitor because you get the impression that Legopolis is a bit of a relaxation vacation spot for the Doctor. Mm. Like he just goes there and like watches them do their thing. Um, but I think all in all, it's a very good performance from Tom. Mm. And I know that it was a rough ride the last season, but performance wise, personally, I think Tom went out on a high. Mm. How about you? I would agree. I think as a performance, I think Tom did really well in this one. Um, mm-hmm. Again, his dynamic with Matthew is very interesting because um, there is that little bit of like, you know, grumpy curmudgeon in there, like at the beginning. But then like particularly when they're shutting down the TARDIS 
you know, when they think that they've landed in the Thames or whatever, and like you know, they have this checklist, they know what they're doing. Um, it makes me kind of curious about like, did they have other little mini adventures between things because they've they've come a very long way the two of them in terms of yeah. trust and in terms of, of being together um which i thought was great and i love that like as soon as he finds out what's happening he does put adric's safety first hmm. he's like hey we're gonna go to legopolis and then in his mind he's like i'm gonna leave you there you'll be safe there like in his mind no one would ever attack legopolis why would you do you know um, and so he sort of keeps that at the front of his mind, which is great. Um, his interaction with Tegan, I thought was really good. Um, for like, I mean, he has his moment where he's like, "You keep fucking like stowing away, and you <laughs> broke in, and where the fuck did you even come from?" And you know, you asked me for help, and and whatever. He has that sort of moment of like, there's so much pressure on him because these people are depending on him, not just to save the day today, but you know he has to take care of them he's a, a, a um an expectation of care there and mm. he, he clearly feels overwhelmed by it in the face of his own oncoming death that like he still has to worry about these three fuckers that just won't like <laughs> i there's one point there i actually ask he goes when like tegan asks what's going on he says oh let me explain it to you adric explain it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um but i think i mean the one thing that i will say with tegan is that like other than the like, where the fuck did you come from? And like, I love his thing where Adric is like, where did she come from? Mm-hmm. What do we do? What the hell? Like, he's just like, <laughs> um. But I think he is very gentle with her. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah, he fobs her off on Adric, but not in a mean way. It's just mm-hmm. in a, I do not have time to explain. Yeah, Adric explain kind of way. Um, he clearly figures out the connection with her aunt a lot earlier. Um, and like the fact that you know when Tegan finally realizes what that means she's like you know she gets quite upset and it was the one thing that like because I watched the behind the sofa for this one because I was curious is the one thing where I don't think this is a fault in the doctor I think it's just a fault in the writing Tegan gets really upset and first he brings her close he puts his arm around her and he walks her two paces towards the door and he lets her go turns around and continues his conversation <laughs> but that's just poor writing yeah you know um i think his interactions with nissa even though limited are really good as well um and again like once he realizes what happened with trina you can tell that he's clearly shook by it Mm -hmm. do you know um so yeah um i do love his interactions with monitor i think that's great and yeah, like overall, I thought it was a really good performance by Tom. You know, ironically, I think he stuck the landing, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, in previous seasons with Tom, we were a bit concerned. Would he stick the landing? Mm-hmm. Um, but in this one, I think he really did. I think, you know, you mentioned like he was the first doctor to sort of know his fate was coming. And I kind of disagree with you on that because they've all kind of known like you know, the second doctor knew that he was like that he was being sentenced to regeneration. So like he knew what was coming. Well But it's just he doesn't have as long of a window to know. Well, you know? I would and s- go on. Sorry. No no I was gonna say like, with the second doctor, I think the exception is the fact that he knew that he would pay some sort of price for some in the some in the Time Lords. But mm. he isn't told until like the like the last what was it, four minutes of the episode that yeah. it's forced regeneration and exile. Yeah. Um, and like the thing like with so like with Bill we sort of see it on screen where he's like oh I'm getting old or whatever and then he essentially <laughs> I, I don't know why with Bill I always sort of chalk up like he sort of goes and hides in a cupboard yeah like, mm. um, but like with John you know he also knew like the minute he left Campo Reproche's um, house the minute he went to bring the crystal back it was sort of like Campbell kind of said to him like this, you have to do what you have to. And he kind of knew what was facing him. Mm. And then, you know, he's stuck in the void trying to get home and he yeah. wants to be with them when mm. he, and very much, I think with John, it was a bit different in the sense that like, he didn't have the comfort of knowing he was going to regenerate. Um, 
because of the radiation. So I, I kind of disagree with you on that. Um, but I think the way they do it in this story, the fact that Tom knows for so long is very different. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the third, what I was viewing it as that, like when he goes back to return to crystal, it's the sort of thing of like, you know, if you do this, there's a very good chance you'll die. Yeah. Whereas here it's no, you're actually faced with the fact that you are going to die. Yeah. Um, but either way, I think they did it. I think, you know, Tom handled it very well. I think the doctor handled it very well. Mm. Um, the I'm kind of gutted we don't get more of Tom with the master because I did like his interactions with Anthony. I thought they were really, really good. Mm. And I kind of wanted to see more of it. Do you know? Yeah. Um, I kind of gutted that like he really only got like obviously he interacted with Anthony last week, but that was as treatments. Um, it's it's very different to Doc John and Delgado because mm. there it was the sort of like um kind of you know former class rivals, you know, the former friends, the series of one upmanship. And a bit of the Xavier Magneto. Ability. Yeah, exa- exactly. Here it's I th- I think it's by virtue of the fact that the master is using Tremus's body is that like the doctor kind of looks at him at times which is like you disgust me. Mm. Um, so th- it it plays for a much more aggressive relationship, I think. Yeah, which I kind of would have liked to see more of. Yeah, because um, mm. like, but I thought Tom and Anthony work really well together. They do. They they just they they really did, and like I have thoughts about Anthony's portrayal of the master, mm. but his chemistry with Tom was was excellent. Mm. Um, one thing I will say as well, like, is that it's great to see that we're now four for four that each outgoing doctor has given a great swan song performance. Yeah. That, that is, that is good. Um, but we also have companions to yes. discuss. So we have Adric, Nissa and Tegan, uh, dealer's choice. Which one would you like to do first? I think we'll start off with Nissa because for me, she had the least to do in the story, mm. which is a shame because Given what happened previously, given what happened in the last story, like I would have loved to have seen more of Nissa in this story based on the fact that, like, okay, you now figure you now realize what happened to your father, you know? Mm. And she's just kind of like she, she's suddenly uh, suddenly appears which is great because she immediately falls back into her relationship with Adric. it's mm. you know it's like that that lovely little duo thing that they had going on which is great but then it's i think is you your to your point about like more time with the master her whole thing with uh, meeting up with the master and mm. still believing that he's dear old dad and then that's felt kind of rushed as did mm. the whole revelation that no 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 your dad is dead he's the master, so all that felt kind of rushed and then she's immediately thrown into the TARDIS, and it's like she's a foil for Adric for what Adric is going through because of the Doctor's demise, and we don't really get and the next kind of most impactful thing from her is when she sees track and disappear from the universal map mm. and what i will say is that sarah sutton's real like her portrayal of Nissa's realization that my stepmother is dead so is my father and now my entire world and all my people are gone this just quiet desperation that she's got going on mm. is is fantastic it's 10 seconds at most mm. but she does it so well but then unfortunately plot takes over and she's immediately fucking thrown back into it um so i think out of everything i'm most looking forward to next week to see what happens to nissa next i would agree i think literally the whole first what two episodes of this story i was like where's nissa where's nissa i, yeah. I knew she was coming back i knew mm-hmm. that yeah. but like where the hell is she um i agree i don't think we got enough of her but i liked everything she did yeah, it, the, um, I what, think what we get her, is good. Her discovery of Anthony Amy, you know, she thinks is Tremas. You know, her worry over like you know what you know what what happened to you. You're looking so much younger, and when he's like, you know, let's keep this between you and me for now, and she's like, no, I want to stay with you. Do you know? Like, there's such a a vulnerability there that Sarah plays really well. 
Um, though I agree with you, the moments are way too short. Mm. Um, I love her and Adric. I think they're adorable as hell. Um, I like that her and her and Tegan kind of have some bonding moments as well, which is, which is good to see, even if they're usually just like off the side bonding moments. Um, but my big thing with Nissa was, and again, like I totally agree that like they didn't get enough of it. And again, like in the behind the sofa, Sarah Sutton said that like it's like, oh no, my entire planet's gone. Ho oh, hum, moving on. Um, but she played that so well. Mm-hmm. Her she thing did. of like you know, the master killed my father, killed my stepmother, he killed my father. You know, that was devastating the way she said it. But like, when she's looking at the star map and she's like, I don't see tracking. And just like the realization of it's gone. She plays it so well and so vulnerable. Because I don't think we know yet how old Nissa actually is. Um, but I'm kind yeah. of guessing that she's not 15, much 16. older than Adric. Do you know? Um, maybe the same age as Adric. So like you get that vulnerability from her. Um and I think I'm curious to see how next week goes because on the one hand, she probably adapts quite easily to what's going on around them because she was a scientist with her father, she's aware of life on other planets, this wasn't new to her. Do you know what I mean? Unlike mm-hmm. Tegan, who's obviously our contemporary companion. But she barely knew the doctor and now he's gone and it's mm. somebody else. Yeah. So that's, like, not... that's going to be like another person who was meant to take care of her in a way like the watcher took her to him. Mm-hmm. You know, I am now very curious as to how that story was meant to go with the watcher picking up Sarah Jane and bringing her to Legopolis mm. and my brain just ran through like the entire rest of the story with Sarah Jane in that position mm. and like the doctor sort of seeing her and being like, Oh my God, like you're here type thing. Um, or the same with Lila. I'm just picking Sarah Jane because let's say it whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Nissa has intrigued me. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. I think it's a bit unfortunate that two stories in, we still don't know that much about her, mm-hmm. but she was kind of, not an afterthought but she was like a tertiary character in both of those stories so yeah looking forward to her getting a bit more development in her next what 12 stories yeah and like this is the thing as always that like i would be very curious to read christopher Beamy's uh novelization of this mm. to see if there is like a section of it that deals with the the, the watcher picking up nissa or what mm. nissa's thoughts would be um I get that they were introducing the new companion of Tegan, but I don't know, like, it just... To have Nyssa, who has a compelling story, going into this one and mm. then just sidelining her, it is it is very frustrating because mm. that whole, you know, I can't see Tracking anymore and he's taken everything mm. kind of from me. It, it It's just, you know, it's going to lead to... Because I actually cannot remember a single thing about the next story. Mm. And bar, I think, um, Michael Shearer in a funny hat. <laughs> um, but, like, you know, it, like, I would love to have that thing where, like, where she's just holding a gun against the master. Like, you took everything from me and the new doctor just pleading with her not to mm. do it. Because that's where, like, I think that this type of story should lead to. But yeah, so looking forward to seeing what the future holds for Nessa. Yeah. The one thing I wouldn't want to see happen is for them to do it like all a new hope where like Adric is torn up because the fourth doctor is gone and Nissa is comforting him. Yeah. And helping him <laughs> ease this transition into the new doctor because that would really piss me off. Uh, yeah. Like to be I suppose to be fair to Adric though, he's had a bit more time than like what, eight hours. <laughs> Which, yeah, but still. Yeah, yeah. Oh, did the old man uh, you met like two months ago die? I'm sorry. <laughs> my whole family was destroyed. That's all my people. But no, no, you you, you wallow yeah. in selfishly, it's fine. Um, I love the I love the fact that it's actually Carrie Fisher doing that fucking voiceover. <laughs> so that's so good. Um but I think next up it should be Tegan. Cool. What did you think of our Australian Aristotus? Mm. 
So for the most part, Tegan is a very relatable character in the story. Like mm. extremely relatable. Like she's plucked out of her normal life on a very stressful day for her, which is like her, meant to be her first day at her new fucking job. And all she wants to do is just get back to it. And mm. I, like that is a completely fucking understandable motivation. Like there's always this thing of like, oh, the romantic notion of being swept up in the doctor's adventures and like going, it's like, no, like not everyone is. I want to be fucking picked up in a time and space machine and brought to an alien planet where they don't know what the fuck is going on and everyone speaks with abacuses. Um, it's so like, yeah, she's a completely understandable character in that regard. And because she's relatable in the sense of she wants to get back home, it is completely re- believable to, to the the amount that she pitches in to help the mm. doctor get her back home. And there's a growth in that as well, from my perspective, is that it stops from being, I want, I'm going to help you to help me get home, to Mm. if I don't help you, there'll be no home to get back to. Mm. So there's a very, I suppose, it goes from being conventionally, I suppose, selfish to selfless as the story Mm. goes on. There is one thing, though, that it it sits weird with me. And I can only parse it in my head by dialogue mentioned in the story and future knowledge I have of the character. And that's her indignation as to what the Logopolitans are doing. Because she goes to the monitor or, the, you know, well, she tells the doctor it's like a sweatshop. And she says to the monitor, what do you call this? And he goes, oh, it's people are working goes, oh we and where i come from it's called slave labor mm. like, where is that coming from and i know that she mentioned before like her her father's farm in australia mm. and like there's this whole self-reliance thing that she got going she was back and forth with auntie vanessa about it mm. um i love that she calls her auntie which is fucking brilliant <laughs> um but it is this whole kind of self-reliance thing learned from the dad but then down the line, Tegan's whole thing is that she's a staunch advocate for indigenous people's rights. Mm. Starts off with Aboriginal rights, but then it kind of goes global. And I'm wondering, was there some, like, that's the only reason I can kind of pass that random, seemingly random fucking comment from it. Because it's very strange for someone to come to an alien planet, look at the way that that world works. And then immediately try to contextualize it in that regards. I, I, it just felt kind of weird to me. Like I, mm. I don't know if you. No, I'll get, I'll get to it when I get to myself. Yeah. So I, I didn't yeah. quite see it that way. Okay, yeah, because like, I was just like, I, I don't know how to. Like, it's a very weird thing, and it's like, I, I don't know if it's a bad thing or if it's like, is it a good thing? I, it just felt very kind of strange to me. That's all. Mm. So yeah, your thoughts, please. So, my thoughts about Tegan, so, I'm going to preface this, right, by saying, I, and I've said, I think I've said this on the pod before, mm-hmm. I have had this weird pole up my ass about Tegan <laughs> for the last, what, 13 years yeah. more. Because I met Janet Fielding at a convention 13 or 14 years ago. Um. I will say, she was lovely, like, in photo op, in autograph session, she was lovely. She made a comment in her panel that rubbed me the wrong way, and I've kind of held it over ever since. And it kind of plays into this episode, which is why I'm mentioning it. Because uh, this is going to be the only time I mention that particular event, because I don't want to keep bringing it up, because Mm. I have grown and evolved in 13 years. But at that event... She basically made a comment shortly after Elizabeth Slayton left the room about how Tegan wasn't like other classic companions. She didn't scream all the time. She didn't need people to save her. Blah, 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 blah. And me and a couple of other people in that room kind of were like, because she was also kind of looking out like in the direction that Liz walked. And we're all kind of going, fuck you, Janet. (laughs) But in fairness, that could also just be me just being really defensive. What I no, what I what I will say is, throughout the last, well, I'll say a similar time span because I've never met Janet Fielding. Yeah. 
but I have seen comments made by her and I've seen mm. like I've, I've read comments and I've seen her make comments that do push that she, she puts herself on a pedestal it seems like she puts herself at least Tegan mm. on a pedestal that doesn't have actually a huge basis in reality mm. yes she was this independent like as we'll see as we discuss it she was a lot of the things that T- she says that Tegan was but she also did have the tropes of classic companions mm. but so the, the reason why I bring it up is it's relevant to the story but also before I sat down to watch the story yesterday I did just sort of compartmentalize that part of my brain I was like mm. you cannot hold a grudge against a character for a comment the actor made 13 years ago when bearing in mind when I saw her I didn't know tickety boo about Tegan, I think I'd maybe seen the five doctors at that point. That was it. So, how does that tie into Tegan the story? Tegan the story to me is an attempt. Um, and I'm not going to say yet whether they've stuck the landing. I want to see a few more mm-hmm, stories. Of course, yeah. An attempt to take Le Shaw and her independence. Sarah Jane, her independence and feminism, and take those two characters so build off those two characters to the next level of feminism in the ninth in the eighties, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So we had the the feminism comments with Le Shaw, we had it with Sarah Jane. Here we have it again with Tegan, where you know she knows how a car works. Do you know? You know she's not helpless in that regard. She's the one who starts the car. Away she goes. You know. When the car, when the they have the flat tire, she's like, "No, we're not going to call any man over to do it for us." Like, "Come on, be, you know, be serious. Like, we can do this ourselves." And she's very much, you know, wanting to be independent, kind of like wanting to show, kind of wanting to show that like she knows how everything works. Do you know? Um, you know, and there's a couple of funny moments where Vanessa's like. Maybe you should use the jack before you try and take the tire off, and whatever. Um, and then you know later on, you know, she continues that trying to be independent or whatever. I think they're overdoing it a bit. You know, very similar to you know, Sarah Jane in a couple of her earlier stories where they kind of look over hmm. and they do a bit too much. Um, so I think they're kind of overdoing it a bit. But well, that's why I want to give it a couple of episodes to yeah. to see if it to see if it settles. Um, in terms of her time, particularly like on Logopolis, which is where she we really see her interacting with the Doctor and Adric, I think she held herself together really well. Um, you know, I love the fact that like she's like, okay, they're going off doing sciencey shit. I can stand here and hold a piece of paper at a window. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, she's like, what is this thing I can do? And she does want to help. She's just, but she's also like perfectly well aware of the fact that she has like zero fucking skill. Um, again, like a slight over correction with the whole feminism thing. It's just like, I'm not going to do what any random man tells me to do. I'm like, okay, Tegan, we get it. Um, men are evil or whatever in her life. Um, but I do like the fact that, again, she continues trying to help. You know, she's with the Doctor and the Master when they arrive on Earth. You know, they're hiding from the guards and she's just like, fuck it. She goes off, you know, hands herself over, you know, to the guards to try and help distract so that the Doctor and the Master can get away. She's like, I can't do what they're doing, but I can be mm. a distraction. I can keep mm-hmm. them occupied, which is great. In terms of... um. The comments around the slave labor thing. Again, I read that in a couple of ways. There's a couple of characters that reminded me of. Um, the first thing is it reminds me of Hermione Granger, right? This idea of making a judgment of a group of people based off your standards, mm. expectations of where you're from. Yeah. Now, in Hermione's case, it's different because house elves are slaves. Yes. And the idea of slavery by choice is a fucked up idea. Mm-hmm. But she was making assumptions without knowing all of the facts and without talking with the relevant people. Yeah. And here, Tegan kind of does the same. You know, 
she sees these people at work, you know, sat in rooms, you know, working away. And without trying to talk to any of them, she makes her comments. I don't think her comments are wrong. I don't think her correlation is wrong. You know, Donna makes a very similar thing when she first meets the Ood, you know, way, way on Mm. from the story. You know, it shows that she has compassion, Mm. which is good. Um, So I didn't see it as a random thing. I saw it as her trying to equate what she is seeing with things that she's familiar with and a bunch of people locked in a room doing a task, not smiling or interacting with anyone and just head down doing a task does sound like a sweatshop. Do you know the idea that they give themselves over to this group think calculation? If you're not familiar with it, if you're not familiar with them does sound like, and you wouldn't mind, but like, you know, Chris Bidmead was talking about like, you know, computer terminology. There are, slave systems in computing do you know mm. like there's it's just the way the, the wording works right um so i don't see it as a negative i said for me i think they were trying to make her two woman of the 80s she go mm-hmm. this is the 1980s vanessa or whatever i'm like we know it's the 1980s Deacon. you don't need to remind us but we're aware there's the 80s yeah the other thing as well um so, so th- those are like all things i liked about her are things that i'm looking forward to seeing develop more mm-hmm. i will say though for the first two episodes i found her to be very annoying <laughs> a right this this might this might be a cultural thing in which case i will see my nieces and my nephew referred to me as Auntie Trish. Mm-hmm. But they'll call me Auntie Trish to my face once. I'm like, Auntie Trish! And then it's just Trish for the rest of the conversation. <laughs> they don't call me Auntie Trish in every single sentence, particularly when we're the only two people talking. Uh, so I don't think it's her a heavy emphasis on the use of Auntie Vanessa. I was like, we get it, Tegan. You're related. Uh, I don't think it's a cultural thing because I like all of my so my siblings, but also my extended family mm. on both sides. Um, well, actually, no, sorry, just on most of my mom's side, we will refer to aunts and uncles as Auntie and Uncle. So like, even mm. even like after after we met them, like so like. Just you know, like oh, Auntie Annabelle. You know, like Auntie Annabelle comes through. Well, oh, great to see Auntie Annabelle. Whatever. Five minutes later, do you want a cup of tea, Auntie Annabelle? You know, like, buy Auntie Annabelle. It's like we, we just use the okay, maybe the title. It's me. So like, yeah, I because I refer to my aunt and uncle as you know Auntie Eileen, mm-hmm. Uncle Liam, or whatever. But actually, now that I think about it, I never call my aunt and uncle as their names, their face ever. Mm. I I don't. <laughs> mm. I'm trying to think of the last time I spoke to one of my aunts or uncles. And I didn't actually say their name at all. Because <laughs> mm. like, we're having even, a dialogue. They know who they are. <laughs> but like, even, when, even when we're not addressing, like, with some of my siblings, like, even when we're not addressing um, them directly, like, you know, we've been, like, a, a group chat, like, organizing a party or something like that. And we're going, mm. right, our auntie, our Uncle James, you know, when I'm out. referring yeah. to them, I call yeah. them auntie and uncle. Yeah. But like when my nieces refer to me, they refer to me as Auntie Trish. When they're talking to me, I'm just Trish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or whatever. Okay, that, that's just a me thing. So, um, mm. But she did seem to say it a lot. Like, every fucking sentence. I'm like, I get it. Mm. You're related. <laughs> There's two of you having... You know, you're having a dialogue. There's just the two of you. Are you afraid she's going to forget her name? <laughs> That's the thing. But um, qu- question of uh, this is like uh, mm. future knowledge. Doesn't Sarah Jane continually refer to Aunt Lavinia as Aunt Lavinia? She never calls possibly, her Lavinia. but but I don't think she does it in every sentence. Okay, fair. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, <laughs> I think it's the every sentence part. Kenny, <laughs> yeah. oh my god! Uh, but it's, I find that slightly annoying. Um, okay. But also, from the minute she goes into the TARDIS by herself. Mm-hmm. no offense to janet fielding but like 
it it just seemed so panto just her running from room to room being afraid of the ceiling mm. um I, I don't know i i was just like constantly just seeing her run from room to room and like getting afraid of like, her being afraid is completely fine mm. Whatever way they shot it, I think it's because we spent so long with her wandering around like an idiot. That I, just, <laughs> so, it's, I was like, "Will you just either don't either stop cutting to her, or just have her meet up with them already?" Because so, <laughs> in, for ages. in so in this particular story, the <laughs> Tegan solo sections really didn't do it for you. No, it was her walking around in circles. <laughs> okay. Um, I know, there is a moment where she sort of has a bit of a breakdown because she runs down a corridor and she mm-hmm. turns out back where she started and she has a bit of a weep and then she's like no pull yourself together I like mm-hmm. that part that was mm-hmm. great you know she can you know we've said it before companions can scream companions can cry that's oh, totally yeah. fine um, and I like that she pulls herself together she's like let's do it again um, but th- there was something about it I think part of it as well is that I'm sounding super critical but these were literally like because I thought her character setup was great, but these little things were coming. I think on the set she found it difficult to run in the sh- in those shoes, mm. and so the amount of running she was doing around the TARDIS, I kept noticing. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in the next story because my knowledge of Tegan mm-hmm. from memes, I'm not going to lie, is that Tegan's thing. Is like I said, she wants to go home. She has a job mm-hmm. to get to. All she wants, I love as well that all she wants to do is fly. And she tries to correlate everything back to her training as a stewardess. Like, mm-hmm. even on the title, she was like, you know, Who's the captain of the ship? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That, that was great. That was a really good tie. And I thought they did that really, really well. Um, and that was really fun to watch. But they're on Earth now. So <laughs> she's going to be around for a while. <laughs> Could she not just get a cab? <laughs> <laughs> where she is now I'm really curious how they pick that up next season because I know her thing is that she wants to get back to, to Heathrow specifically I'm like but they're on contemporary earth now so why does she stay I'm, I'm so curious as to how that's going to play out actually just because you said that there I I, I do remember something else other than Michael Shear in a really funny hat is uh, just a couple of the poster generation uh, sequences but mm. as for plot and why Tegan stays or how Tegan gets wrapped up in it no cannot remember okay so I've I had a bit of a, a rambling there on Tegan but no, no. I've had a lot of hang ups about this character I'd never mm. seen so well you see this was the thing was that I think for both of us like and because I remember like that you told me that uh, Janet Fielding story mm. just before I started going to the Tegan era and I, you know, like, how dare, like, how dare anyone say that about Liz? Um, but also, as well, as I said, some of the things that I had seen and heard as I was going along didn't really fucking warm me. Uh, so I was going, no, compartmentalize. So this time around, we'll see if my attitude towards the character changes because my, char- mm. my attitude towards the character at the time was informed by compartmentalization. Let's see if it happens again by compartmentalization. Um, yeah. But... Adric on what is vastly becoming the SS orphanage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or sorry, quickly because yeah, fastly. I meant to say I meant to say fastly, I said vastly. But yeah. Um poor Adric. <laughs> like everyone's leaving him. Like like first of all, you had his brother died. Mm. Now you then you had Roman and K9 leaving. Mm. And I, I actually did like this, the, the little sweet sequence, which was like, you know, are you sure you want to get rid of Romana's room? Because also, I, think... I love the fact that he just ejected her room as well. Because yeah. <laughs> it begs the question, has he ejected the other people's rooms? Or is it just because he saw Romana's most recently? Possibly because he, he saw Romana's most Or because Romana recently. had the biggest room. Hmm. Maybe. But see, I, I, I couldn't stop laughing at that section because I'm going through a rewatch of a show called The Venture Brothers, and there's mm-hmm. a villain in it called the Monarch who has a giant floating cocoon, mm-hmm. and like every week he comes to the compound with like this new fucking um, weapon, 
and uh, this time around it doesn't work. But one of his uh, henchmen, who's like kind of on the outs with him at the moment, is describing the attack to another person. He goes like, oh yeah, this is classic monarch. He'll come in low and he's either got a fancy new weapon, which in this case is called the acid magnet. <laughs> um, but it doesn't work. And he goes, yeah, yeah, no, it didn't work. So, okay, he's going to do something now, which is he will like, he'll do something stupid to save face. And the monarch just goes, jettison the lunchroom. And all of a sudden the canteen just fucking flies out of the cocoon. <laughs> At which point the the, the henchman goes, what day is it? He goes, and their friend goes, oh, it's Thursday. He goes, oh, sweet, it's for each night. So he just runs over to all the chafing dishes. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I could think of. Uh, but anyway, back to Adric. Poor Adric. No, seriously, poor Adric. Like, the Doctor is the last connection he has to anything. Mm. And, like, he obviously noticed something up with the Doctor via the Doctor's like especially after he meets after he watches the doctor talk to the figure in white mm. and he knows that something's up prepare for the worst and the doctor being kind of snippy but also at the same time a lot more you only need to kind of get yourself ready i do like the fact that the doctor wanted to leave uh adric i think more so adric than tegan because tegan just was happenstance but adric he felt probably felt that adric would be safe here and could also join in because of his mm. mathematics so I like that, but here he he's and the worst thing is like Adric is trying to save the Doctor. He's trying to do mm-hmm. everything he can to save him, and it isn't until the the Watcher essentially sort of says, "I'm assuming says you can't save him, but what you can do is you can help him." Mm-hmm. And it's brilliant because throughout the entire story, we get we see a showcase of Adric's intelligence, mm-hmm. which is first of all in the Tardis loop because he effectively picks the locks of everything but also he he's willing he, he wants to learn everything which is great but then as well when they're on logopolis and he's going through the city streets and everything with the monitor doing the code and mm. correcting the code and participating in that also i do like that there's a good emotional performance from adric here because mm. he's dealing with his own struggles which i've just gone through but he's there to help nissa as well yeah. And I know that we kind of said that her thing is all too brief. Mm. But I think his method of probably like distracting her with the current situation is, is a form of caretaking. Mm. Because like it's like, look, yes, tracking is gone, but maybe the doctor might be able to do something. Or at least if we save the doctor, we can figure something out. And it's, yeah, because again, like she's just lost everything. So I think both like whereas an earlier version of Adric would have been a bit more petulant, kind of going, come on, we need to get a move on. Here I think it's from a much more understanding and compassionate level. Mm. And he's probably learned that from I would definitely say more so from Romana, <laughs> but the brief interactions he had with her, but definitely this protege role he has with the doctor going on. So this is another good story from Adric, I think. Mm. I'd agree. It is a really good Adric story. I think we get to see a lot of him here. Um, again, there's a lot of that protege stuff, particularly in the TARDIS. Like mm. when he's like, on the do- the doctor's like, you know, giving him a leg up so he can lie on top of the TARDIS to take the measurements, yeah, and stuff like that. I thought was really really good. Um, but even the fact that like he really wants to go to Gallifrey, yeah, you know, and I'm like, you do really well on Gallifrey, Adric. He would like, do you know? And the fact that like he's not like, he's clearly trying to keep up with the doctor's like random thought processes, and you know, he, you know, the doctor's talking about this. He's like, cool, I need to understand. But now he's changed. Okay, cool, and he's like trying to keep up. But like the fact that he's so focused on the cloister bell as well. He's like, the cloister bell is ringing. Like you said that this is the, you know, mm. all hands or whatever situation. Um, so yeah, I think as soon as he sees the doctor go talk to the watcher on his own, though, I think Adric is convinced that like, A, he's convinced the watcher is the master. That's mm-hmm. obvious. Um, but he's also convinced, I think, that, that the master is like holding something over the doctor and he's trying to be so supportive and sort of help him do what needs doing. Um, that's great. On Legopolis, I think he also does really, really good. 
Uh, oh, by the way, I love him picking the locks. I'm like, I don't think we ever established that I drink him pick locks. But I love it. Yeah, you know, no. <laughs> I love it. I love that that's what he's doing. Um, But on Agopolis, I, I really liked it because, like, there's a couple of things that we find out. One is that the doctor was teaching him English. So, you know, we obviously understand Adric talking mm. and stuff, but he reads a different language. He grew up in a different language. And we see him fuck up once or twice. Do you know where he's like, no, I, I do understand these symbols. And we find the symbols that it isn't like big complex things. It's two characters, a letter mm. and a number. And, you know, the fact that, like, he seems quite proud of himself that the doctor has taught him the alphabet Mm -hmm. and his numbers in English. And, you know, the fact that he does fuck up once or twice, you know, it sort of humbles him a bit, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we've said before that, like, he has the the cockiness of an intelligent teenager. Do you know what I mean? So um, there's that. I think the way he is with Tegan is very good. Like, he's clearly, like, He's way younger than her, but he's trying to take care mm. of her. His excitement when he sees Nyssa. Yeah. He's like, oh my god, it's it's, it's Nyssa. It's great. I think, he, I think he developed a really good connection with her last week. And, you know, I don't think he's ever really had a friend his age. No. Do you know? So I think, I think he really is a few forward to that. The only negative I would say about Adric is that he does make one comment which is kind of sexist, but I don't think that's the way he meant it. I think, again, it goes back to him being like, oh, I know, like the doctor taught me like the earth symbols, um, which is when, you know, they stabilize the TARDIS or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's like, what can I do to help? And the watcher's like, oh, or the monster's like, oh, we need to go down through this. He's like, oh, well, I know the earth symbols. And, you know, Tegan, you know, has the understandable, slightly ignorant reaction, but the understandable ignorant reaction of like, what are you doing? We have to do something. Um, and Edric turns around and is like, you know, we are. And he sort of emphasizes the we. Mm-hmm. And it comes across a little bit like, yes, yes, the men are working. Um, but I don't think that was intentional in the script. It may have just been the line read. Mm-hmm. Um, or it could have been like that Adric just sort of feeling you're kind of important because the doctor taught him the earth letters so he can he can help do you know never mind the fact that tegan would also know earth letters because she's from yeah. there I, <laughs> I, I didn't view it as sexist but more of a sort of um what's the intelligent version of elitist yeah um yeah. but I don't, I don't, like it, it was a one-off thing it never comes up in the rest of the episode Mm-hmm. So I don't think it was intended to be that. But I think that's just the way it sort of came across um, mm. in it. Um, I am curious to see how he gets on with a younger looking doctor. Um, Again, because he had this sort of like ward protege relationship. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to see if that will continue. Um, And again, I'm really looking forward to seeing him with Nyssa. I like Adric and Nyssa. I think they're cute as hell. I don't see them in a sort of like Ben and Polly, Ian and Barbara couple kind of way. Mm. I kind of see them in a bit of like a Harry and Sarah, um, Jamie, Victoria, Jamie, Zoe sort of sibling kind of way. Mm. Um, and I'm kind yeah. of looking forward to seeing that play out. <laughs> With Tegan just also there. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but those two have such a good connection. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of it. Yeah. So now we move on to the monitor. Yeah, what were your thoughts uh, on the monitor? Yeah, uh, I liked him. I mm. did. I thought it was a really good performance from John Fraser. Like he's he's so kind and welcoming to the Doctor. Like and he's genuinely excited to show stuff off to people. Like you know the the things that they're capable of doing. Um, also, I love that he genuinely seemed to care about the well being of Adric, Nissa, and Tegan. Like, so when the doctor said, I need you to look after them, it wasn't a burden, you know, like of this, because the one thing that we notice about uh, Logopolis is that every Logopolitan that we're presented with is is male. Mm. So we have, and we, and they're all old. visually, yeah, they visually look old, but we don't know if that's like mm. the, 
the standard setting for them. We, we don't know what we actually we've known nothing about their fucking society. But the fact that he would welcome them in regardless of age or gender is you know, or even like fucking intelligence quotient is mm. whatever, you know. Uh so it was cool. Uh I loved his interactions with the doctor because it did feel like kind of old friends, you know? Mm. Um and the whole thing is like the the secret of Logopolis is is very interesting. Like mm. by in order to save their universe, they have been drilling holes into not parallel universes, but mm. universes outside of the normal space time continuum. Mm. Um in an effort to prevent as it's not like to completely halt the universal entropy but mm. to at least slow it down to a more fucking sustainable rate because as you said without Logopolis it would have happened already which is fucking terrifying uh, really going through like existential crisis mode there um, and his like he never stops fighting as well which is a cool thing like he mm. never stops and he, even when he says like that it's too late he never stops trying to buy more valuable seconds Mm. and his death is actually it is trad it is horrible to watch to him see him slowly and and not in that sort of classic fade away but for him to patchily disappear mm. like his torso is gone before his face is gone and the back of his head's gone and all this type of stuff so it's yeah it he, he's his death is one that i would definitely chalk up into those tragic character deaths mm. i'd agree um, for me, I I really liked him. Um, I there's a couple of things that I I I particularly liked that stood out for me. You know, you mentioned like his relationship with the doctor. I thought was great. You know, very much you know old friends coming together. Um, what I love with the way he was with you know when the doctor was like, "Oh, can they stay here with you?" type of thing was the doctor goes into the terrace and closes the door, and everyone's like, "Hey, what's happening?" And he really sort of is like a dad where he's mm. like, hey, so it's very unlikely anything will go wrong, but he wouldn't want you in there in case it did. So come on, you come away with me for a while and we'll let him do his work and I'm going to show you some other stuff. Mm. And it's like, it's, it's 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 kind of horrible when you actually equate it to, you know, um, someone, you know, worst case, like someone abandoning their children, like leaving their children with a grandma, but also like, you know, when you have very, very little kids and say, like, mom or dad is going into the hospital or, you know, say, like, if you have, like, a parent in the military and the person is going on deployment mm. or whatever, as though you sort of take the young ones under your wing and, you know, tell a white lie to keep them from worrying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought that he did it so naturally with mm. them and it was so soft and caring, I thought it was very, very sweet. Yeah. I think the other thing that sort of really struck me is like when he started finding like when the whole thing went wrong and like the tartar started like shrinking and he's like what what is this do you know because I mean there is a little bit of a sense at the beginning with him that like the whole thing with the Faris um replica mm-hmm. and the doctor's like why do you need this it's like he is hiding something from him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the fact that they kind of used the Faris thing to do the calculation and you know then it starts going wrong and like a part of you sort of thinks for a second like oh my god like you know maybe he always wanted it to go wrong or whatever because even though we know it's because you know a whole bunch of um like like apologies were taken out of the mm-hmm. hive mind um, there is that brief moment where you're like, is this what he wanted? Did he want it to fail? And you see, no, like he's so like, what is happening? This this, this shouldn't be happening. Mm-hmm. And like his panic and his drive to figure out what went wrong, I think, you know, is really, I think it's really relatable. I think it's really well done. It was really well acted. Um, I do think his, you know, his final revelation of like what they've been doing all this time his like his 
like, he's resigned to the fact that they're fucked. Mm-hmm. But he will keep fighting anyway. Yeah. Do you know, and I agree with you. I think his death is really tragic. It kind of has a sort of like, you know, MCU snap vibe to it in a way. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Um, but yeah, I think I think for a story based character, I think he was really interesting. I think he had really good dynamics with everybody. He had a really good sort of dynamic with Adric. He mm-hmm. had some good moments with Tegan, where he clearly doesn't understand what she's talking about. <laughs> but like he's trying to appease her anyway. Yeah. Um good moments with the doctor. His like again, sheer revulsion with the master. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Um, I think all of it was really, really good. And yeah, I think it's sort of a tragic ending for that character. Um, mm. And I think a really good, you know, um, prominent character performance. So yeah, overall, very good. So now we come to the man himself. Yes, the master. Ah, there you are, you certifiable whack job. <laughs> you didn't leave us for long, did you? <laughs> um... Like, I might come across as irrationally angry for the next few minutes, right? Because, right, the plan at the start made perfect sense to me, okay? Which was, take a couple out, take a couple of Logopolitans out of the fucking sequence, fuck up the code, sabotage it so the Doctor's TARDIS will kill him. It's like, fucking brilliant. Everything afterwards, though, seems like a complete fucking clusterfuck. (laughs) And I'm just like... Like, and I might be getting irrationally angry because like it's okay. The so the logopolitans are keeping a secret, so he can't know that what he is doing will fucking will will, will have these disastrous consequences. That's fair enough. And then it's like the uh, the fucking monitor and the doctor are both saying like no no you need to stop now because it could already be too late and he's like and he just turns it off and it's like look see you're over exaggerating and it's like all right even then it's still all right you warrant to fucking know but then it's this whole fucking thing of like you know trying to run away it's like they've just told you you can't run away like you know, like there's there's no work, there's no li- like fucking live to fight another day bullshit because of what you've done. They're all trying to fucking stop it, and you could help, but you're so fucking narcissistic that you can't be seen to be a fucking good guy to help prevent your own demise. <laughs> and then it's like afterwards, you know, when they go to when they eventually do, um get to fucking the real Ferris project. It's like, stop trying to fucking kill people and just save the help, save the day. And even then at the fucking other end of the thing, it's like, okay, cool. You did save it. But then it's like, I can keep everyone saved or I can kill us all. And then it's like, but what's the fucking point? If what happens if everyone in the universe gave you the collective middle finger, would you pull the plug and kill yourself just to spite everyone? It like last week we saw someone that waited years, years to pull off this fucking amazing coup of a plan. That's unbelievable patience. But you've reverted back to the same fucking idiot that you were beforehand. <laughs> and like Anthony Ainley, his chemistry with Tom, oh fucking brilliant. Um but and I don't know what it is, but it's just he comes across as it's because he's the, his bottom row of teeth are all on, on display. It, like, he just comes across like such a panto villain at times that it's kind of hard to take him seriously. And like, and I know that's the direction, and I know that there's like obviously Anthony's input into the master's posture because he's very kind of you know crooked, hmm. which is he's very kind of slouch figured. And that adds a sinister aspect to it. But it's... I, I kind of maybe put it down to John Nathan Turner because he was a huge fucking panto fanatic. Mm. That this version of the Master is a bit too panto. And it's such a shame because we saw how amazing Anthony Ainley is when he's mm. doing something serious. And we also saw a really good rendition of a cool, calm, calculating Master done by Jeffrey Beavers. 
So here it just seems like such a backward step. Yeah. I think for me, I think I actually really enjoyed the master in this one. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved Anthony's chemistry and the master's dynamic with the doctor. I also loved the sheer, like, you utter bunt. Yeah, oh yeah. The way he is with Nyssa. That's just depraved. The way he treats her, the way he plays into this whole, oh yeah, my dear, like he pretends to be her dad. Mm-hmm. It's just so messed up. And even when she's like, you're not my dad, you killed him. He's like, yeah, but this is his body. So I can kind of be your dad if you want me to. And I'm like, well, please don't ask her to call you daddy. It doesn't get really creepy and weird yeah. <laughs> pretty quickly. It, it, um, it's like, it's almost like a kind of, you know, fucking Hannibal Lecter where the skin of your fucking victim type thing. Yeah. Um, but I think that was really good. I think in terms of his plan, I thought his plan was genius because it was like, you'll want to fix this fucking thing eventually. So I'm going to find one and I'm going to find a police box. I'm going to like take over its general shape mm. and whatever. That was great. I think his whole thing with Agopolis is he wanted to take out some Agopolitans to fuck up one thing and kill the doctor. I think his other plan and the rest of it, I think that will ha- that's what happens when he comes up, comes up with plans on the fly. Because he got to Legopolis and he saw this Pharaoh's project thing mm-hmm. and he's like, what the fuck? Like, here's him just thinking that, like, you know, he'll shrink a few of them, maybe get them to do some computing for him, you know, a bit of, a little bit of universal domination, just through maths, right? You know, he'll you know be able to turn off their sound for a while. Like, imagine, I imagine that that was meant to be more local. Mm-hmm. Like, that he could, like, you know, torture them or whatever into doing what he wanted but then he gets there and he's like what the torturing is that what are they doing and he sort of starts putting a couple of things together and he's like oh this would be great if I had the power of this but because he doesn't fully understand what they're doing because what they're doing is fucking bonkers it is mm-hmm. bonkers what they're doing and like <laughs> I love that his brain is just like when they're like trying to explain to him like no 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 there's a, he's like you're taking the piss. That can't seriously be what you're doing. Fuck off now. The entropy of the universe is just like, no, come on, be real. I was like, it's his own, like, you know, maybe it's the sort of like, you know, what happens when you face the end, when you're actually coming face to face with the end of the universe. And he's like, mm. now you're taking the piss. That's ridiculous. Do you know? It'd be like someone in Armageddon being like, a big giant fucking asteroid coming towards the planet. Like, Fuck off. What are you on about? Like, that's fucking bonkers. So what I think his plan, like, after the tire starts shrinking, I think his plan from there was him just thinking on the fly, being like, there's something mm. seriously wrong here. I want to control this fucking shit. I was just planning on controlling a couple of them to get to do what I wanted, but this, okay, there's something here. And I think it is, he completely misunderstands what it is they're doing. Yeah, too. stop he probably, making... He probably sees it as like, oh, they've got this huge beacon to transmit to the universe. Oh, this would be great because I can transmit because like, they can change matter. He's like, oh, this would be great. I can use this, but then he, he picked up on the wrong thing, and then his final conclusion was wrong. And then he sort of realizes what's happening, and he's like, "Oh no, uh, no, no, I did, I, no, I didn't want to do this." Stop <laughs> this isn't making what I wanted. Sh- stop making shit up as you go along. It doesn't work for you. It's never worked for you. But yeah, so like I found it. I found it quite funny. I actually didn't mind it that much. My bigger issue with it was just like, he can't help it. Like, he can't help. Like, Delgado's master was evil. Mm. But he was also suave. Yeah. And sophisticated. And, you know, he tried to at least pretend that he was, you know, a well-mannered individual. Because of what happened to him, in Invisible Enemy, and mm. then what happened in Keeper of Trikin, Like, Don't, I think uh, this mean, master is Deadly Assassin bonkers. Invisible Enemy. Deadly Assassin, what did I say? Invisible Enemy. Invisible no, Deadly enemy. Assassin. And Keeper of Trikin. Like, I think this is, like, you know, we'll talk about, like, your future iterations. I think this is 
the true onset of the batshit crazy master. Yeah. Do you know? Um, like, when we think about the masters of the modern era, I sometimes find it hard to track them back to Delgado. It doesn't sometimes connect. It connects with fucking this fucker, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, absolutely can. Um, like, one master I'd be very interested to listen to more of is the master from the Big Finish series. Because mm. um, I have no idea what his iteration is like. But, yeah, no, look, <laughs> Ainley has two things. One, he does come across as genuinely insane. Mm. Two, you feel like that if you touched him, you'd need to wipe your hand for grease because he just feels yeah. so fucking oily. But also, like, uh, part of that, though, is the fact that, like, the guy can't go anywhere, like, without laughing maniacally. <laughs> like, when he was going around, like, getting the the stabilizer thing or whatever, and he's like, oh. poof, <laughs> poof. <laughs> he just can't stop evil laughing. He literally yeah, yeah. can't. And like he's there with the doctor being like, Hey, we saved the day. Hooray for us. Aren't we fantastic? You should go check on your friends because they're getting in trouble. He's like, Yeah, you know, it's so good we saved the day. I was like, yeah. It'd be so easy for this to go wrong though. <laughs> Even I could do it. I was like, wait till he's out the door. He can't help it. He can't help it. He's just like Just, just no, stop it. <laughs> no. Master's got a master. I can't. I can't help it. Yeah. Um, so I actually quite enjoyed him in this. He's probably one of the most enjoyable masters stories I've seen. Um, but he is Panto, and I think mm. we're just going to have to get used to that. Um, mm. But I don't think it's bad. I think it's just very. I think it's very different from the master we've seen in yeah. Tom's era because Deadly Assassin was very fucking different, mm-hmm. and. Keeper track and last week was very fucking different. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, I saw this and I was like, oh, I can see future masters yeah. stemming from this. <laughs> and this is the thing that's not that right is that you know me, I love Panto because we, we fucking went to the Panto for years. <laughs> um, Birthday tradition. Was, yep. It was even in Panto for a while. Um, but like, and like, there are times where it suits the character perfectly. But then there are other times where it, 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 for me anyway, it kind of distracts from what's going on. Mm. And like there were like there were one or two parts here where, like it did work, which was, um, the even like you know the unholy alliance handshake type thing, you know, because mm. he was kind of like you know really kind of the sinister laugh. I'm like that's kind of cool. But there are times where it was like the, you know, like, well, I'm getting the fuck out of here, or, you know, run, <laughs> where like the hair kind of came all flappy and he was just like out the fucking door. Um, like the hands were even raised as he fucking said it, like, you know, like I'm getting out of here. Um, also, as he, like, I actually love the fact that he ran up the stairs and then the, the dramatic look back <laughs> before leaving. Um, yeah. So, it also as well, the fact that. We now have Nissa as we, yeah. I, it would be interesting to see as well because more so for the Nissa side of things because we know how good of a dramatic actor Anthony is with the side of things. I can't mm. wait to see how it follows on. Yeah, like I'm really looking forward to. I, I really hope that they keep the Nissa master connection, and the way they kind of did with Delgado and Joe. Yeah. You know, I really hope they do keep that going because mm-hmm. of all the characters, Nissa has this perpetual connection, connection yeah. to him. And mm. I don't want it to be like, I would hate if in the next story that they're in, she doesn't re- respond to him as the man who killed her stepmother, killed her father, caused the downfall of her people, and is walking around in her father's skin. If she doesn't react to that, I'll be quite odd. Yeah. But I th- the one thing that will definitely be a uh, constant is that this guy is a bunting prick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, he is. <laughs> cool. So time to give our final overall score of this season and of Tom's run. Going to be interesting to see how this season 
does just a reminder to everybody that this season is currently sitting at an average of 2.88 for Paddy and 2.67 for me. To get this to a 3.0 is going to take some high scores from you and a solid 5.0 for me <laughs> if it, if we're going to hit the 3. So. Yeah. Uh, our good friend Paul Canower from the Half Measures podcast, he actually messaged me with those scores earlier on. He was going, wow. <laughs> uh, he also said that he agrees with the fact that we shouldn't do Trial of a Time Lord in one go because he thinks that it deserves to actually be spread out. So thank Very you, Paul. Good. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> he also not that we needed for, Not yeah. that we needed your permission, yeah. Yeah. but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah no it was funny he also said he appreciated the fact that i pronounced his name correctly and i'm like fucking i hear it every week <laughs> uh, but yes. enough about paul we'll do okay. a podcast with paul another time okay so we've reached the end of the road yes. i think it's fair to say that the engine got us there in the end but it was looking fairly dicey <laughs> on the final run-up no that's a conversation for another day though that's mm. a conversation for our fucking uh, rambling for Legopolis, I think like last week, it was paced very well. Mm. I was thoroughly engaged throughout the entire thing, even when I was watching a how not to fucking uh, replace a car tire on the middle of a fucking uh, or on a slip road. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it was like, and it was full of great character dynamics acro- across the board, like. From monitor with the companions to the doctor and the master to the master and like T, you know, no, definitely Tegan and you know the curtailed version we had with Nissa. Um, thought it was really done really really well. Uh, I love the funky eighties espionage soundtrack as they're running across the field. <laughs> um, it was really really good, and I like the fact that we got a heroic end for Tom. Yeah. You know, he and like. <laughs> All the regenerations, the the reasons for the regenerations have been different, where it's the combination of stress of the situation with old age, or as punishment, or Mm. as, um, what would you call the third one? It would be righting a wrong, because he had to return the crystal. Yeah, righting a wrong. To hear where it's like actually saving the day. Dying mm. in time, dying to content to saving the day. Uh, each one's been different. Each one has stuck the landing, I think, in terms mm. of. And, um, so I really enjoy those aspects of it. Like I think some great character growth as well for Adric. Just it just has gotten better and better the last couple of weeks. Um, I know that we kind of stayed the K was a bit of the, but again, Matthew was still kind of finding his feet. The flip side of this, though, is that I was a bit disappointed by the uh, short shrift that Nissa got in the story because mm-hmm. I really wanted to see more of it. Um, and as well, for the master, as I was just getting irrationally angry at the like the the panto aspect of it. I like I fucking that that's not a a knock-on because I don't want that to be a knock-on for the entirety of the fucking character's appearances. Mm. It's just that at times it feels out of place. But I think my issue with the Master here was that it was just getting irrationally angry after after watching a fantastic top-to-bottom plan and fucking implementation and portrayal last week. It's, you're back to getting in your own fucking way again. And Mm. that was just kind of frustrating, you know? Because we, uh, so I think overall, uh, for me, between the bells and whistles, this is a four out of five. Not bad. Not bad. Um, I think, like, in terms of, because we said it last week, in terms of a trilogy, it's actually fucking really good. Like, we've Mm -hmm. had, for me, this is two consistent stories, and... Also, this is the we're in back to back trilogies now because you have the E Space trilogy and mm. you have this one, and this is doing far better than the E Space trilogy in terms of consistent good story, good performances, and pacing. Mm. So yeah, so, four to five. With Paddy's four out of five, that brings him over the three mark. Paddy's average for the season is three point zero four. <laughs> well, 
My, I think it was my lowest is still season. Uh, How is my lowest season, still? Season fourteen. Uh, season three is still my lowest. Yeah. Two point seven five. No, it's not season. Uh, oh, wait, season 15, season seventeen sorry. is two point six seven. Season fourteen is two point six three. All right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. Yeah. So, should I keep you in suspense? No, let's bring you small bits. Yeah. I'm not giving it a five. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> to make that clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I really enjoyed the story. Um, I, I honestly truly did. I think the things I liked about it, there was one thing about Adric I forgot to mention, which was mm-hmm. Adric, his first time on Earth, stealing a bike to fake a bike crash to distract mm. the police so the doctor can escape. That was very good. Yeah. Well done. Actually, I, I forgot to mention it as well, but it was fucking brilliant. That it's was brilliant. genius. Um, <laughs> so for me, I think this was a great story for Adric. It was a great story for Tom. I think as a going out story, I think for Tom, it worked really well. Um, I think as an introduction to Tegan, I think it was a strong introduction. Like I said, some of her scenes went on a bit long for me and like they kept hammering the same thing for a bit too long for me, but that's just personal preference. Mm-hmm. Overall, it was a very strong introduction and a really good first outing for the character. I think we got to see a lot of who Tegan is, which is great. And I'm looking forward to seeing that develop as we go forward. Um, I think Nissa, I I wanted to see more of her, which is good as a character, bad in a story, but good as a character. Um the idea of Legopolis, I think, is really interesting. One thing I didn't mention is that like when they do the slightly higher shots where you can see all the roads, you can tell it kind of looks a bit like a brain. Yes. Um, yes. There's like this sort of like this sort of cerebral pattern to it, which which I thought mm. was really, really good. I think the concept of the people of Legopolis and the idea of the calculations that they do are so immense a computer can't do it. Do you know? It kind of reminded me of the Stargate SG one episode Entity. Do you know where there's this entity that comes to the Stargate, goes into the computer systems, and then, you know, it, you know, Jack tries to attack it or whatever, and it goes into Sam. And you have that thing of where, like, she's holding down her fingers on the keyboard and the entity goes into her. And, you know, eventually, you know, they're like, you know, you can go back into the little hive hub you made for yourself. And they said, no, they can't. It had outgrown the computer, mm-hmm. but Sam's brain, it could still do more with it. So the idea that the human brain has more capacity than a computer, we just don't know how to leverage it, I thought was really, really interesting in that. Um, Delgado's master, I kind of like, or not Delgado, and the alien's master, I kind of like a bit more than Delgado's, to be honest. Like, he has several screws loose, and he's lost some of them completely. Those screws are never coming back. Mm. And I kind of like that. Do you know? I, I, I don't know why. I like the fact that he's just batshit crazy. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, particularly, like I said, the way he was sort of playing with Nyssa, I thought was like, it was like so fucked up, but like in the, the best possible way. Yeah. Do you know? Um, so that was good. In terms of, you know, the story itself and scoring it, I will say I don't quite agree with you on the pacing. Okay. I think some things went on way too long. Like Tegan wandering around inside the TARDIS. A lot of the back and forth up the road, down the road, whatever, on Legopolis, I thought went on for a bit too long. Um, I don't like the fact that we didn't get as much development of Nyssa. And I, I think part mm-hmm. of this is, and this, this is a problem when you go back to watch something that came out years ago. And particularly it's part of the problem of doing this podcast. In fact, the last week I had to look up you know, Sarah Sutton for the trivia is that I literally spent the first two episodes wondering where Nyssa was. Yeah. And because I really wanted to see her interaction with Adric, I really wanted to see her in it. And, you know, the fact that we opened with Tegan, I thought was good. It, it's great that we got to see her life on Earth as an individual, which we don't really get to see very often, like people's like individual lives. But I just wanted more Nyssa because I really liked mm-hmm. her last week. And unfortunately, that was my own hype. Mm-hmm. But it did diminish my watching of it because if we have this amazing cliffhanger from last week it just takes so long <laughs> to get to that point this week 
yeah. um, which I found kind of annoying. And the other thing as well, and like this isn't really like me to say, but actually, it is a little camber who I was talking to. Um, oh no, I do. So it's having um our friends over at Mission Log, you know, have a Discord, and we were having a discussion around season two of Strange New Worlds, mm. and it was the international crew uh over on the mission log discord or some of us anyway um but some of the guys from the states went on as well and one of the guys sam was saying that like you know uh, they were talking about the musical episode Mm -hmm. and you know we were talking about some other things and he said that he kind of wanted more science in his science fiction show Mm -hmm. and i was like you know I couldn't really care less about the techno babble, like in sci fi. Like, I, I, I don't watch sci fi for techno babble. I think mm-hmm. techno babble supports a story about people, whereas mm-hmm. Sam is more plot focused and like mm-hmm. whatever. But I think for, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent, I think for me in this, I think, I think the sort of real world science that Christopher was trying to bring in. Mm-hmm. It just kept taking me out of the story. Okay. Do you know it was it's not that it was that confused. The idea of entropy isn't that confusing, but like everything that they were trying to do to fix it and everything else, and I was just that kind of going, okay, techno babble, techno babble, techno babble, plot, techno babble, techno babble, techno babble, mm. character interaction, <laughs> techno babble, it was like cool, like. I think it had a bit too much techno babble okay. for me, which I know is a weird comment to make on a science fiction show, but I think particularly with a science fiction show like Doctor Who, like it's good to have real world science influences. Mm-hmm. But for me, I think there's a balance you have to strike for it to be believable and interesting in context. Like, yeah, no, I agree that there does need to be a, there does need to be a balance between mm-hmm. the level of, I suppose you could say, character-driven stuff and the science science nature of why, of why they're all around. Um, I didn't mind it because uh, yeah, mm. like, I didn't have an issue with it, but I think there are like there have been other times where it has been like extremely fucking techno babbly. I'm like Jesus Christ. Whereas here, I didn't find it too much. I think the issue I had is that we had two separate techno babble focuses. Mm. We had the TARDIS and the Chameleon Circuit, mm. and all of that part, and then we had the CVE and the Entropy of the Universe. And so once we kind of resolved the TARDIS part. And then we were starting up another techno babble for the final episode. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just get on with it. Do you know? That was probably the bit like for me. Because like, we had like the computer bit in terms of like the the block function and all the, like, we had all of that, which I was like, cool. And then that resolved itself. The TARDIS is proper size. We found out what happened with the guys disappearing and whatever being made into like little toy things. And then it spun up this next thing about entropy, and I was like, okay, like, okay, we're we're still going with the with the sciencey part. And I think because we had such good character potential in Mm -hmm. Nissa and the Master, um, you know, the Master and the Doctor, Nissa and Adric, Tegan and anybody, I kind of wanted to see more of that, Mm -hmm. and less, you know, red wire, blue wire. Do you know? Yeah. But that's just a personal thing with me, do you know? Um and you know, other people take it differently. So for me, I think overall I thought it was a good story. I think it was a good ender, I think it was some good introductions, but there's just a couple of things that made it sort of not the best watch for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not really one I'd be rushing back to, do you know? Okay. Except again I'd watch I'd watch the beginning, I'd watch the end. I'd watch one or two scenes in the middle. (laughs) Okay. But I probably wouldn't watch the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I gave it 3.75. So not quite the 4.0 that you Mm -hmm. gave it. Um, Mm -hmm. But the reason why I gave it 3.75 rather than like a 3.5, which I was kind of thinking about, was that a lot of those things are just like my own 
very very personal preference <laughs> mm, yeah. and the fact that the Nissa thing a there was the lack of character development which we both agreed on but my main Nissa thing was that was just my own hype going into this week because I knew she was going to be in it yeah do you know which not really fair to judge the story on that that was just my own hype so 3.75 which means that my average for the season sadly does not pass 3.0 <laughs> It's 2.82, which puts this, uh, that was 2.67, that was 2.67. My lowest season is, okay, so I have joint lowest, which okay. is actually um, season 17 and season 14. So season 14 was 2.67, season 17 is 2.67, and this one comes back next with 2.82 so it is still in no, you, you oh no actually fit, no i have a 2.75 i have a 2.75 you mean seven season 15 not 14 uh i do i was either in the wrong row yes i do so <laughs> season 14 and season no i mean season 15 and season 17 I've forgotten now what I said. Yeah, those two anyway. <laughs> yeah. Are the bottom two. Fuck, stop confusing me. Um, <laughs> but I think our next week's episode, which is going to be our rambling for Tom, is going to be really fucking hard. I've been fucking, dr- I've been dreading it simply for the fact that we have like 44 stories to kind of fucking part through. I like, wouldn't oh. mind, right? We started Tom and I had a plan. Mm. Plan was to keep a note every story. How does it rate in relation to the last one? Mm-hmm. Like for a doctor performance story. Did I do that? No. 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 All, no also, be- between the jig- between the jigs and the reels as well. Like uh, we're about a y- almost a year and a half into doing Tom's mm. era, whereas yeah. like everyone else, like we 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 had kind of kept it to roughly the same numeric like you know 29 21 20 whatever mm. but with Tom it was just like that between work and illnesses and fucking everything happening it's just a bit longer so like I think we don't have that rapid memory that we would have for previous people but yeah, yeah. it's gonna be int- it's gonna be interesting it's gonna be really interesting to fucking nail it down to the it, to, to three. go from what did you say 44 episodes yeah 44 stories to six yeah is top three top bottom three is gonna yeah. be is gonna be really tough but i am looking forward to it so mm. that will be next week then the following week we have the extra special rambling of canine mm-hmm. and company yep then we have a couple of weeks that we need to take off for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. And then it'll be on to a new doctor. A doctor that I've literally seen one story of, which is The Five Doctors. That was 13 years ago. I mm-hmm. don't remember it. I think I'm now entering my longest run of I have no fucking clue what's happening next. Yeah. In terms of an individual doctor. So obviously I hadn't seen most of the second doctor stuff, but I'd seen mm-hmm. a lot of Doc John stuff. But yes. now I haven't seen Peter Davison and I haven't seen Colin Baker and I haven't seen the first season of Sylvester McCoy. So um, I have no clue what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one final thing. I didn't take points off it because again, it's personal reference. I still hate the fucking star intro. Oh, it's uh, like it's Tom's paint expression on it, which really fucking it's, doesn't help. It's not even just that. I just don't like it. I don't yeah, like it. Give no. me my old intro back. Yeah. It's, uh, and again, it was done to kind of compete with the Buck Rogers, uh, I think Battlestar Galactica is in around this time, but like the mm. American sci fi intros, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I, no. no. Anyway, conversation of the day. Yes. Till next Until week. next time. Bye. Bye.